So good morning, everybody. My name is Jessica Holmes, and I'm currently serving as interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. So today we're going to begin the, I think, much anticipated Green Mountain Care Board hospital budget hearing process. For those who don't know, every year we are tasked with reviewing and establishing hospital budgets for 14 of Vermont's community hospitals. So to conduct that analysis and ultimately make our decision for each hospitals, we look to our statute and our hospital budget rule for guiding principles. Our review requires us to balance several often competing factors. For example, the need to slow the growth in healthcare expenditures, while also ensuring that our hospitals have the resources they need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and provide the high quality care we expect in our communities. So as we look to balance containment, access, quality, and health system sustainability, we must be mindful of this year's unique circumstances and the significant headwinds we face. We have historically high inflation rates, workforce shortages, and the continuing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. They're all at play this year. And both nationally and in Vermont, hospitals are facing unprecedented financial challenges as are businesses, families, and individuals. So board members, I, I just want to say what lies before us is not easy and I want to thank you all and I want to thank our amazing staff in advance for their diligent work in reviewing these hospital budget requests. Our immediate task over the next few weeks is to set fiscal year 23 hospital budgets for our 14 community hospitals. But I want to remind everybody that the board is working closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work outlined in Act 167, which aims to move us closer to a sustainable hospital system that ensures Vermonters have access to high quality, affordable care. And that work is going to involve extensive data analysis and community engagement to identify options for a more sustainable path forward. With that backdrop in mind, let's turn to the immediate task at hand which is hearing from the hospitals about their 2023 budgets. We're gonna to have to ask meaningful questions that aid in our decision-making, and we're gonna to have to arrive at budget orders for each hospital that ensures short-term stability. So I wanna thank each hospital right now, uh, and I will again throughout the hearings for the time and effort taken to submit the documents for our review and for preparing for these hearings. Especially I wanna shout out to those hospitals that submitted all the requested information and on time. We really appreciate that. Uh, a few housekeeping notes about the hearings for the next two weeks. This presentation is a public meeting. It's being recorded and transcribed. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so there will be a publicly available record. If any hospital's leadership believes that there's any confidential information that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider, either as part of the hospital's presentation or in response to board or staff questions, please let us know before responding. If needed, the Green Mountain Care Board has the ability to go into executive session and review confidential information from hospitals. Executive sessions would be limited in scope as provided by the open meeting law and limited to information such as contracts and information that would be considered confidential under the Public Records Act. So if there's an issue of possible confidentiality comes up, I'm going to call on the board's legal counsel to determine the scope what could be discussed in executive session and if deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time i will ask the board member for a motion to go into executive session so mike if you could convey some of this information to your members that would be helpful as we go through the hearings uh, in the next few weeks but before we do hear from southwestern which is our first hospital up i believe we have allotted some time for some brief comments from both mike del treco from the hospital association and mike fisher from the healthcare advocate so with that why don't i turn it over to you mike del treco uh, for your comments sure and thank you um, good morning chair holmes board members members of the public and our hospital teams as budget review begins our hospitals are facing numerous challenges before I discuss them, I just want to take a moment to recognize some achievements and acknowledge the tireless work that Vermont hospital teams do every day. We have a lot to be thankful for. Vermont has an uninsured rate of 98%. Our delivery system continuously ranks at the top of the class. Vermont hospitals have funded reform efforts and, to, and continue to support value-based care. We've significantly bent the cost curve reducing growth rates that were once over 8% to current averages just over four. Our hospitals and their team supported one of the best and uh, campaigns against COVID-19. Our hospitals are innovative 
and they've expanded the definition of hospitals far beyond bricks and mortar. We now support housing, help manage food insecurity, solve transportation problems, and much more. All of this work is in the spirit of building a stronger, healthier, and more vibrant communities. Leading up to these hearings, each hospital has gone through an extensive review process evaluating revenues, expenses, and the resources necessary to care for their patients and communities. Each budget has been reviewed and approved by their community board. This is important to note as these boards understand their communities, their hospital specific challenges, and the importance of affordability. You've heard me say it before, but I describe these budgets as need based. They are about patient care, our staff and our communities and come before you at a time of great uncertainty. I've been working in healthcare for my entire career and I've never seen set a set of circumstances so complex and so severe. The situation we are managing is not normal. A hospital business is not like any other. We operate 24 seven and 365 days a year. We cannot close if things are too expensive or or for lack of personnel. We don't make products. We care for people that all have unique health needs. Currently, we have a workforce challenge like none, none other before. Appro approximately 65% of these budgets go to cover expenses related to workforce and operations. We are experiencing unprecedented inflation and supply chain issues that are contributing to skyrocketing costs. 30 plus percent of these budgets go towards purchasing medical and surgical supplies and pharmaceuticals to care for patients. All of these challenges is the fact that many of our patients, uh, adding to these challenges is the fact that many of these, our patients are coming in sicker and need more expensive, extensive care. To be clear, our, our system is at capacity and running at capacity is never a good thing. It se severely compromises patient flow and care. To provide some context over the past three weeks, our system has been running at between 93 to 96% capacity. And unfortunately, this is becoming a trend, not a one-time occurrence. We have a stressed mental health and long-term care delivery system that places incredible pressure on our hospital. This drives up costs as patients are stuck in our hospitals even when they don't need to be there. Last week, we had 125 patients waiting for placement. And over the last three weeks, this number has ranged between 105 and 138. Again, not a one-time occurrence. We are still managing a pandemic and preparing for the potential of COVID surges, and no one can predict the next challenge. Caregivers at our hospital are experiencing verbal abuse and violent acts against them daily. And under our current structure, we have not grown at medical inflation, and as a result, today's inflationary pressures are hitting us harder. All of these issues are taking a toll. Our workforce is exhausted, our communities are challenged, and, the, and for, the, for the current fiscal year, most of our Vermont hospitals are reporting losses. These budgets produce minimal operating margins, an average of 2% for the system. And as you know, margins are critically important as they allow hospitals to maintain and improve their facilities, care for patients, and pay their employees. I've said it before, we need strong hospitals in Vermont. Because these are budget hearings, we talk about margins, operating expenses, rate increases, financial ratios, and all the details that make up this information. But I ask everyone listening to look beyond these numbers and these budgets are about caring for our patients, our staff, and our communities. These budgets are thoughtful, are needs-based, and I respectfully ask the Green Mountain Care Board to approve them as submitted. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak today, and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, Mike Fisher. Mike, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. you yeah, yep, I, I managed to cover up my mute button, so that made it hard. Good morning. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak for a moment um, and bring to you the healthcare advocates perspective as we enter into these hearings. So, you know, clearly these are not comments directed at today's hospitals, but for all the hospitals. Um, 
I, I want to recognize and appreciate the words of Mike Del Treco. Um, we agree this is a particularly difficult time um, for caregivers and for families. Um, so we want to pass on our appreciation and recognition to, you know, with all due respect to the hospital administrators who will come before us uh, today in the next two weeks, we really want to ask you to help on, help pass on the, our appreciation to your frontline workers. Um, so thank you for your work. Um, you can expect, you know, a couple themes that you can expect from the advocate's office during this, this year's hearings. Um, uh, with regard to free care policies uh, and uh, financial assistance systems, the HCA appreciates the collaboration we had last legislative session with the hospital association and with Vermont hospitals on the passage of H-287, uh, now Act 119. Uh, we recognize that the law does not require hospitals to come into full compliance for another two years, yet we now have a standard to strive for on the details of free care policies. And we recognize that some hospitals have already taken steps to come up to that standard. Uh, we're happy to work with hospitals on these details, and provide as much assistance as we can on plain language summaries and other details as hospitals work to come into compliance. We also understand that an excellent free care policy is not the end of the story here. There are people on the ground working with patients at each hospital, helping them navigate very challenging financial systems while they're dealing with serious health challenges of their own or, or for their loved ones. It's a combination of good policy and a highly functioning financial assistance office that we're all after here. The best policy ever is of little help to people who don't know about it or who get little help with the process. We believe that by looking at the relationship between free care, the free care and bad debt lines in your budgets will help us gain an insight into the overall functionings of these systems. There's a real range of functionings across Vermont hospitals. Through these hearings and discussions after, uh, we hope to identify some of what drives this range and seek ways to improve the functioning of these systems uh, across hospitals. As in past years, you can expect from the Health Care Advocates Office a focus on health equity, particularly race equity, uh, and um, questions related to what is currently being done, what is planned, and what remains to be done in the future. And of course, you can expect uh, questions from us about affordability, um, about, um, about the, the relationship of the budgets before you and its impact on people's ability to get care. I, I want to go back and say I appreciate the words of Mike Del Treco with regard to the needs of Vermont hospitals, and um, and you won't hear from us a pushback uh, about that need, but you will hear the advocate continue to ask the question of whether Vermonters, whether they be ratepayers or pe people paying for out-of-pocket costs, uh, can actually pay the bill. Thank you for a few minutes to speak and um, look forward to the next two weeks with you all. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Okay, well, we are literally exactly on target. So it is 845 and knowing that we have a tight schedule, I think what we'll do is we're going to hold all board and staff questions until the end of Southwestern's presentation. Um, but if we could keep to that a lot of time and plan to wrap up your presentation by 10, that would be fantastic. So with that, I think I'm going to ask Russ McCracken, can you please uh, swear in the Southwest witnesses? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair Holmes. Um, Mr. D, Mr. Majedic, I think you said there was one additional or a couple of additional people who might speak. So we have, we have Dr. Trey so Dobson here and also um, um, Jim Roy. So there's four of us. Great. Um, if I could have all four of the witnesses uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly you swear that, that the evidence you shall give you shall relative to the cause now under consideration, consideration shall be the whole shall truth the and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I, I do. do. I do. Great. Great. Well, with that, Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Southwest, whoever is kicking it off and, and uh, Thank you very much for coming. Okay. 
Well, thank you, Jessica. Thank you for inviting us today. It's good to be here to, to kick off the, the budget session. And I also um, <clears throat> want to thank Mike Del Treco for uh, his opening comments. He certainly capsulized um, my short comments, which um, you know, which I'll do right now. But also, I want to also do a shout out of thanks to Steve Majetic and our finance team who put together this this very difficult budget um, over the last number of months. And um, you know, the the budget's already a little bit old in terms of um, you know when we submitted it back probably uh, three months ago and what how things are impacting us even today. So um, it's a it's a you know, it's a document that continues to be organic and change and live and it's a, it's a challenging one and I will say in my 40 years as a healthcare executive this is the most difficult time that I have faced and I think our, our most team members would say the same I think most people on the call this is a a time of great uncertainty for us and challenges and and the need to try to stabilize um, our situation and um, you know Steve, if you're going to um, do the slides, maybe we can go to the, just the first one. Correct. Yep. Um, I'll wait for you. Can, to be ready. can everybody hear me? We, you, okay. Yes, I think we can. Yeah. Just, just let me, uh, I'm going to click and um, I think uh, we're, we're up, right? Okay. So maybe Steve, you can just go to the next slide, please. And um, again, I'm just going to take a few minutes here and, and talk about some of the major forces. And Mike did a great job um, outlining it and kind of teeing it up. I mean, for us, Steve, on the financial uncertainty, maybe you can show that um, next slide on that. Um, you know, we're coming into our budget year um, and on really uncharted territories for us. We have um, we have strived very hard during my time here and Steve's time and the rest of our leadership team to keep our, our, our um, budgets balanced. And uh, we've had 12 straight years of operating gains, um, anywhere from one to uh, up to 4%. Um, but you know, we're in, str in strange territory. 2022 looks like it could very well be the first time that we're in a negative um, operating um, by year end, which um, is something that we're, you know, we certainly were concerned about. And as we put together our budget in 2023, we had a very slight um, operating gain. But um, as Steve will talk about later on, that operating gain for 23 is now being challenged with some new trends that we've just been incurring. So we are, are not uh, feeling overly confident in our in our financial situation that is uncertain and um, in challenging um, us almost every day. So we start off with um, the financial uncertainty, which is new to us and um, hopefully will not be a trend into the future. And then um, as we go into the question of workforce shortages, that's this is probably our biggest challenge. And you may be hearing a consistent theme from other hospitals throughout the hearings is that um, um, the workforce side of our operations is is very difficult, and um, you know, and we took a different path than most hospitals across the state during the, the the pandemic. We we made a we made a strategic decision that we would not be we would not look to bring in traveling um, staff, uh, especially in the nursing side. We 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 made a decision to try to make investments in our current workforce. And, and to in the staff our operations um, by not bringing in external um, external uh, workers. Uh, <clears throat> time will tell whether that was successful right or not, but uh, we we were we were glad to do it, but we've had to make major investments um, to to handle that um, type of decision. Uh, we made um, unbudgeted decisions in terms of uh, wage and salary changes. We accelerated uh, wage and salary adjustments, and um, it impacted us to a rate of over four million dollars. And um, and it's something that we struggle with, um, even making the investments to try to keep our workforce in place. I mean, we had some success, and we also had some failures there. So um, our workforce challenges is um, 
is something that we're very concerned about on a daily basis. And, and I have to do, I have to make a comment here. Um, our nursing leadership team, led by Pam Duchesne, who's our chief nursing officer, and her assistants, um, they, they really uh, walked the talk. They went and they staffed the floors themselves. And this is happening every day where um, our leadership is working on the floors, caring for patients, and really setting, you know, setting the trend and the tempo for other people to follow. And, and we are, I'm immensely, you know, proud of them and appreciative for what they've done. But uh, we continue, and as we look at our 2023 budget, this is a con continued source of major concern. Next um, challenge. So next is our capital projects. And, um, you know, you've heard this in the past when we've been to the Green Mountain Care Board every year and we talked about the fact that, that Southwestern Vermont Medical Center has the oldest plant of all hospitals, the age of plants, the oldest in Vermont. And we are in the midst of commencing major projects to update our infrastructure. And then um, you'll see in the, the picture there, that is a, the start of the building of our a uh, major emergency room project. We have an emergency room main floor project, which is over a $31 million project. And um, again, in my 40 years of being in healthcare executive positions, I've never seen a, a market like this where the, the pricing um, that we've developed and we spend a lot of time doing is changing um, almost weekly. And so, some major, you know, some of uh, um, some of the major, uh, um, you know, um, sub um, projects within this, such as electrical and iron and you know, steel, is up over 40%. And, um, and this changes on a continued basis. And that's if they can, if the, if the contractor can even find laborers. So we are in the midst of trying to do necessary upgrades to our, to our infrastructure in a time of great uncertainty as to, as to where these capital projects will end up in terms of their costs, but yet we're forced to do it. So um, again, that's in, that is impacting our budgets on a real-time basis. And then as you move into the area of population health, um, you know, our, our biggest unknown in our budget for 2023 is what will be the impact of, of COVID-19 as we move forward. And again, we made a decision, and, and, and I guess we could be criticized for it, but we made a decision not to budget for a major surge of COVID-19 in our budget. So we pulled out any um, uh, expense related to COVID-19 as well as revenue impacts. So um, that is a, that's a concern that we have that um, we really have no idea as to where it will take us. Even though I think, you know, led by Dr. Dobson, who will be speaking later, I think we had a remarkable effort to deal with COVID-19 in terms of our community. I think, um, you know, I'd say one of the best responses in the, in the states and, 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 and treating many, many, many patients. And, uh, and we're ready, we're gonna do it again if we need to, but certainly that will impact our overall financial um, stability. Um, we're also having impacts um, on the population health side in terms of mental health um, patients, which is significant. Um, actually so significant on the mental health side that we're also looking at potentially starting um, mental health services um, that we're currently investigating. And we have that actually, a, a, we responded to our RFP just recently by the Department of Mental Health for, for uh, inpatient adolescent services. So we're taking our responsibility very much to heart with, with, uh, with um, you know, using our, our, um, our, certainly our mission to meet the needs of our community. And even though we know financially, if we do this, this will have a negative impact, but we're still uh, certainly going down that road. And then the next on a major impact is the, the issue of system-wide um, system gridlock. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, Steve, maybe you can go back one slide there. Um, we have a, a, a system and many hospitals are, are feeling this but um, it's very difficult to, to get our patients um, through, our, uh, through the health system. Um, there's throughput issues. There is major gridlock. Our length of stay is increasing. Um, 
and that is impacting us uh, on a daily basis. On any given day, and Mike, Mike Del Treco talked about this, we're, we're seeing five, six, seven patients who are in our hospitals with no place to go. And when I finally do get it, we finally are able to get a, a disposition and a bed for these patients. Oftentimes, we're not able to trans transfer them because the, the local ambulance um, operations don't have the staff to transport, um, transport these patients. So you almost have a perfect storm. And on top of that, you know, we're dealing with increased um, insurance denials. The insurance companies are, um, are, I would say, being more predatory in terms of how they're handling um, hospitals and patients. And, and, and many of them are certainly denying care, which um, we feel is really, um, you know, in this day and age, very, very distressing for, for um, patient care. So, um, and on top of that, um, we have a growing workforce violence problem that has been a major stress point for our system. And this, this in 2022, we are trending to a 100% increase in the number of incidents of violence and abuse of our staff. And many of our clinical staff, nurses and physicians have been injured on the job and their lives are being threatened every day by, by um, certain individuals. So, and this is not what they signed up for. And this is not why they wanted the healthcare. So we are, we are very concerned about that. We are spending uh, more funds in terms of contracting with local law enforcement to protect our workforce. And we will, we will protect them at the best of our ability. So these are all forces that are, that are making our budget that we're submitting today, one which, um, to be honest, I'm, I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about meeting the targets that we've established and, um, and one which could easily turn on us. And it'd be a need for us to come back and talk to you at the Green Mountain Care Board at a, at a later time. So let me ask um, Steve Majedic to step in and start to go through the details of this budget and certainly we're, we're, we're happy to answer any questions you may have as we go through it. So Steve. So good morning, everybody. Um, so we're gonna start off um, with um, uh, just an overview of our uh, statement of operations. As you can see that our uh, fiscal year uh, 21, uh, we had a significant gain from operation, mainly driven by our COVID-19 uh, uh, provider relief funds we received. 2022, uh, when we prepared this projection, uh, we projected almost a million dollar loss. Uh, that projection was built off of the April financial statements. Uh, since then, uh, we have seen some trends that were not in our projection, and uh, we are trying to hold that uh, projection uh, as best as we can. Um, and uh, you'll hear me talk about several circumstances that have changed since uh, we did this projection as well as our budget. Um, our budget uh, in 22 um, had a uh, operating margin of $3.6 million. And um, uh, as you can see, we are, we are not achieving that. I'll go through all the details. I did eliminate uh, in, the, in the budget, because uh, we talked at length about it, the, the loss, uh, the, the accounting loss and the termination of the pension plan, which typically goes in non-operating activities. Uh, just so we don't get sidetracked. Uh, the pension plan was terminated this year. We met all the targets uh, and the final numbers will be um, um, reflected in our 2022 audit. The, the actuary is finalizing them now. Uh, we secured uh, with an insurance company uh, the benefits uh, to our employees that earned them over the years. Um, and we, we bought annuities and uh, we took off um, about $750,000 uh, a year of administrative costs uh, off of our uh, profit and loss statement by doing this. Uh, and, and the word termination, you know, that's the, that's the word they use, but basically we secured the, the benefits that our employees earned uh, over the, uh, their life of employment here uh, with a, um, a rated insurance company and the insurance company is now administering uh, those benefits. So here's a, here's a graph, as Tom talked about it, over the past 12 years, you can see if you start back in uh, 22, and the red line is basically our budget. Um, and as you can see, before the pandemic, we were pretty consistent. 
We were budgeting a 3% operating margin most years. We went up a little bit uh, in 18 and 19. Uh, 3% operating margin was our target. Uh, that's what uh, investment advisors um, um, in the healthcare industry uh, look for. Um, that allows you to invest in yourself. That allowed us to uh, improve our balance sheet, um, to be ready to go into capital projects. It allowed us to fund our pension plan to, so we can terminate it. Uh, and as you can see, um, the actual results, which is the black line, um, we were... Uh, before the pandemic, uh, all but for really 19 and 18, you know, uh, the world was changing a little bit, but we were consistent um, with our operating margins. Then the pandemic hit, and um, um, I'm not I'm not proud to say, but it seems like every projection I do since the pandemic has not uh, come come to fruition, uh, both on the upside and the downside. So, uh, uh, and I think moving into the future. Um, you know, as a CFO for over 32 years, uh, 12 years here at Southwestern, um, you know, I kind of pride myself uh, on uh, and my team on, on being consistent. And before the pandemic, I thought we had a good track record and it's just been uh, kind of little all over the place. And uh, our projected loss uh, for, uh, for 2022 is uh, the first time uh, we're showing a loss. Uh, we did budget a small, um, as you see by the cursor, a small operating gain, but those uh, gains are in jeopardy um, as we move into the new fiscal year. Um, in 22, our operating results, uh, our operating revenues were about $8 million over plan. Uh, about $5 million is directly related to the COVID-19, uh, both testing. Uh, we tested over 100,000 individuals in our COVID resource center. Uh, we vaccinated uh, nearly 50,000. We administered nearly 50,000 um, uh, vaccines uh, in our COVID uh, resource center. Um, therapy services um, and inpatient services um, were also um, in our revenues. Uh, we have, uh, and, and so that was a big driver to our $8 million uh, positive revenue. Um, if you back that out, um, $2 million, uh, we would have been about $2 million over uh, due to um, services really, mainly in the emergency room being over our, our 2022 budget. Our express care, which is our physician um, service uh, without appointments and imaging services, uh, all those volumes uh, are, are up. And then we also had about a million dollars worth of positive revenue uh, and other operating revenue related to 340B funding, uh, uh, revenues funding from our foundation, some grants. And there was also some monies in there for, um, um, from a state contract related to COVID-19. Um, so, you know, those were the drivers in our, in our positive revenues. Uh, however, our expenses um, were over about $12 million over our budget. Uh, salaries and wages uh, are projected to be 6.3 million over or 12% over plan. As Tom talked about it, um, we made uh, significant investments in our in our workforce. Um, instead of paying agencies, we paid our our nurses to try to keep them uh, here. Um, and um, you know, as Tom said, our our nurse managers were were outstanding. They worked side by side with the managers, um, with the staff, and uh, um, helped us uh, uh, minimize our agency cost. Um, we also had um, about $4 million worth of, related to that $5 million of COVID-19 expenses. Um, and this is identified direct cost, while there also are indirect cost. Um, our physician locum costs um, were about a million dollars over budget and inflationary and other costs are over about $1.3 million to make up the $12 million uh, driver. Workforce challenges in 22, uh, and they're gonna continue in the near future. Um, we increased the hospital's minimum wage um, uh, in this fiscal year, and we accelerated our pay increases. Uh, typically we get pay increases uh, in the May, June timeframe. We gave them in January. So that, that, that was a, a deviation from our budget. Uh, we created incentives and compensation to staff. Uh, we, we did some temporary salary increases. We did some permanent um, salary increases. Um, and uh, we also changed our shift differentials to meet what was going on in the market. Um, and we provided shift bonuses when staffing levels were near crisis mode 
um, in order to keep uh, the proper level of staffing. Uh, we also are creating uh, an ongoing uh, program, greater incentives for recruitment and retention, um, because it's a lot cheaper to retain your staff um, than, than to constantly have them turn over. And also, uh, we need to create the pipeline. And we've been working uh, for many years, uh, and we continue to uh, add to our uh, recruitment efforts uh, with education loan forgiveness programs. Um, we, we're we're giving additional compensation to individuals who assist in the recruitment and development and retention of staff, sign on bonuses, which everybody's doing, uh, and constant market review of our compensation levels uh, to make sure we can recruit and retain individuals. Um, uh, you know, the hospital, we were pretty fortunate. Uh, we're, we're near nurse traveler free for a short period, about eight weeks. We had about four travelers. Uh, the question for 23 is, will we be able to maintain this? Um, and as Tom mentioned, uh, Pam Deshane, our, 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 our chief nursing officer, she's committed to doing it. But uh, you can only, um, uh, you know, the, the staff uh, may get tired. Um, RN vacancy rates are between 8 to 14%, depending on service location. Um, overall hospital-wide vacancy rate is 7%. They don't sound that high, but uh, uh, when positions are open for a length of period of time, uh, it does uh, create stress on the re uh, rest of the workforce. Um, and again, uh, here are some of the education and recruitment. Uh, and we're working with both uh, the local colleges and high schools uh, uh, to, to especially get the, the BSN uh, uh, high school grads to enter the BSN program. Uh, just last week, uh, we, um, for the radio, in the radiology area, we um, have an agreement with Hudson Valley Community College. We, we have also an agreement with an existing uh, community college uh, for radiology techs, because um, it's just not nursing where there's a workforce, it's everywhere. It's from uh, the nurses to all the way down to the housekeepers, to the food service workers, um, uh, and to materials management that we're having challenges. So we're trying to work with the local uh, education um, facilities um, on, on getting some programs through the hospital. So hopefully the employ uh, the, the, the kids will uh, want to come to work here when they're done with their studies. Um, Hospitals, you know, it's it's changing. Uh, we're creating, you know, un, an additional strain and unplanned and unreimbursed uh, resource consumption. As Tom mentioned, um, you know, just on in the inpatient acute care setting, um, we're averaging four to five patients that we cannot place uh, into a long-term care bed. Patients that are sit uh, in our emergency room waiting for placement. Um, you know, a, a quick estimate of the cost um, without doing a whole cost accounting, uh, four to five patients a day. You multiply that by uh, 365. Um, uh, it, it's at least a million dollars uh, with no reimbursement because uh, we do have to staff them. You do have to treat them. You do have to um, uh, document and uh, it's at least a million. Uh, I can make an argument that it could be uh, upwards to one point five to two million dollars with additional cost. Um, that we have, uh, but it's, you know, on the low side, it's about a million dollars and there's no additional reimbursement. Uh, we're looking at programs that possibly will help us, uh, there working with the, the local nursing homes. Um, we're looking at some swing bed opportunities and things like that, where we can get some money, but it won't pay for, uh, the additional costs. Um, as I mentioned in our emergency room department, we're seeing an increase in patients uh, with behavioral health needs. Uh, here's a sim simple graph uh, that shows um, that we've seen a 40% increase in patients with behavioral health needs uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Also, the graph uh, on the right side uh, shows that uh, our patients uh, with mental health needs and behavioral health needs are, are staying longer in our facility because it's difficult to um, uh, place them because those facilities are also uh, being challenged with all the same challenges we have, uh, bed capacity, uh, staffing. Um, we actually had a patient in our emergency crisis area uh, with seven weeks. Uh, emergency crisis area is in our emergency room. 
um, was dropped off by a local nursing home and that uh, patient refused to um, um, uh, take the patient back. So significant challenges uh, and adding uh, additional cost and resources. So, so that's really what's been going on in 22 in and in, in, in a really, you know, fast um, uh, 40,000 foot uh, review. Um, we submitted a budget of $188,000. That's that includes the fee for service and fixed payment revenues. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, here's our budget. Our budget is uh, uh, that we submitted. Now, uh, just so the the board and, and everybody understands, um, we start on our budget journey in March. Um, April, uh, we do a lot of the work, and May we do some fine tuning. Um, oh, I, I got to go back. I've got to make sure I can get back there. So since our budget was prepared, um, you know, and, and the journey, like I said, starts in March, goes into May. We get our board of trustees to approve it in June, in, um, earlier in June, and then we submit to the Green Mountain Care Board uh, at the end of June. Since the budget was prepared and approved by our board of trustees and submitted, many assumptions used, um, believe it or not, may be outdated. And this happens every year, okay? There's just one or two things that that occur and we we have enough room where we can adjust um i can tell you um things this year are moving much faster to the larger magnitude uh and let me give you a few examples since our 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 budget was approved by our board of trustees and insurance companies approached me for a 30 percent rate decrease um I, in my in all my tenure here, I, I have not uh, ever uh, had that. You know, you know, you get a few adjustments that people are asking for. Insurance companies you negotiate and you meet in the middle, and we usually have room in our budget to absorb it and and make it make some slight adjustments. Uh, the thirty percent rate reduction is a one point six million dollar uh, hit to our budget. So that would erase that uh, profit of 904 right uh, off the bat. Um, negotiations continue. Um, the insurance company oh, okay. made us a, um, an, an, an adjustment to their proposal that uh, reduces it to about $1.4 million from the reduction. We also uh, got an, an, uh, an insurance company also uh, gave us a new payment policy that they were gonna institute. And after we reviewed it and, and talked to them, uh, the review showed that we were going to lose, you know, over another another million dollars. But after talking to the insurance company, showing them, um, you know, the impact to us, and and they they actually um, uh, pulled it back, um, and we worked through it with the insurance company. And it was not the intent of the insurance company to do what they what the words said. Uh, so we were able to dodge that bullet. Um, as we do our budget each year, our, our professional uh, liability insurance, uh, we put a 15% increase in our budget. Uh, uh, when we did the, um, um, the original quote was at 34%, which we got the last week in June. Uh, and we actually settled on a 24% uh, rate increase. So we have a budget variance already. Um, Another local vendor uh, came to us with a uh, increase for 23%. Uh, we have now settled in, uh, we budgeted 10% increase and we're now, uh, we settled in, uh, I believe it was a 14% increase. So you can see um, things are just, you know, um, when we budgeted just as an example, a 10% increase for this vendor, um, you know, I was kind of like that, that's way too much, but uh, when we sat with him and he showed all his costs and he showed what he was running, showing what his labor was, uh, it was a challenge. So um, we th these are just things that are happening. Uh, and every day, uh, it seems like, and, and I've never seen anything like it um, in my in my 30 plus years as a CFO. So uh, we're going to stick with our budget. Uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, you know, it's a challenge each day, um, but uh, we are working to achieve this. We're putting uh, plans in place to, um, because we need uh, as a health system, uh, Southwestern Vermont health system, as a statewide health system, 
we need to be able to reinvest in ourselves because uh, operating losses, uh, we don't, uh, we can't reinvest in ourselves. Uh, we have an old plant. We need to do that. We built our balance sheet up over uh, the past 10 years uh, to be positioned uh, um, to, to, you know, bring our physical plant up to, um, you know, modern standards. You know, we have a lot of work that we're, we're planning and uh, without, Without operating gains, uh, we can't uh, do that. So uh, it's going to be a challenge. So um, as Tom mentioned and I mentioned, um, our revenues are $188 million. Uh, no revenues related to a COVID surge. Uh, we wrestled with that a lot. Um, but how big is the surge going to be if there is one? Is it going to be you know, um, 10 cases, 1,000 cases, 5,000 cases, 20,000 cases in our, um, uh, and, and nobody really could, could tell. So I didn't want, we didn't want to put into our budget a, what I would call a guesstimate. Um, it's out there um, and we will adjust and we will do the best we can uh, at, at, at any level. There's no federal or state COVID relief funds included. Uh, and we pulled out all the 22 COVID testing, vaccine, therapy, and inpatient out of our out of our budget base and built uh, our 23 uh, budget plan uh, with with that. So there's not that uh, the direct cost. Um, you know, the, of course, indirect costs are always uh, uh, built in. Um, so um, so that's how we built our budget. There's no upside or downside risk related to the One Care Vermont model. Um, you know, we, we, I take the position each year, we're going to be smack in the middle. Um, if we get some upside, uh, great. If we get some downside, we'll have to make adjustments. Um, and, uh, the care, the care teams, uh, get reports every, basically every quarter and meet with one care on, on, on where we stand. So we make adjustments accordingly, uh, over the past, um, uh, years of the pandemic, uh, there have been no material downside for Medicare because of uh, the healthcare emergency um, in, 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 the, in the country. So our increase is 11,000, 11 million, sorry, uh, or 6.35% over our 22 budget. Uh, it's an increase of about 2.33 over our projected. Remember, our projected does have uh, COVID revenues in there. And when I, I step back and I look at our 23 budget compared to our 19 actual, which was the last um, uh, non-pandemic year, uh, we're up about 3.8% a year. Um, here are the components. Uh, uh, revenue, rate, price, what we get paid is $8 million compared to volume and services of uh, 2.8 to get from the 177 to the uh, 188. Uh, we're, we're requesting a, a net charge increase of 9.5%. That's what we're uh, planning on realizing from commercial payers. Um, we did put in a Medicare increase of 3.2% at the time the budget was prepared. Um, recent um, um, uh, the, the the IPPS came out, which may be uh, about four to four point one percent. So there's a little headroom uh, there. Um, we've seen over since um, about February, we're seeing a significant increase to Medicare and Medicaid patients um, in our in our actual uh, results. Uh, so we put a payer mix shift in. I, I believe this payer mix shift may not be enough um, at, if I base it upon recent trends. Uh, we also put a small increase in for Medicaid uh, and disproportionate share, and we increased our bad debt and charity care by $250,000, which you know, in light of what's going on in the economy, uh, maybe uh, a, a, a not so conservative number. Um, as I said, the charge increase is uh, a, a gross charge increase of 9.5% uh, on approximately 65% of our charges. Um, no across the board on our physician practice charges, rehabilitation service, and selected other services because uh, we do look and do compare ourselves to uh, Vermont hospitals as well as uh, New York hospitals in the Troy uh, Albany area. 
and we look to the, our south, uh, what uh, people are, are, are charging uh, in those areas uh, in, from Massachusetts. Um, and the drugs and medical supplies, there's no across the board increase on charges. Um, and the $7.9 million increase represents 4.2 of our total 23 uh, net patient service revenue budget. Um, the Medicare, as I talked about, the Medicare increase was budgeted at 3%, maybe a little greater. But the payer shift to government uh, payers of nine, uh, 957000 may be a little light. So that increase in the uh, IPPS uh, to over 4% uh, will be chewed up by our, our shift uh, to governmental payers. Uh, and um, so overall, when you look at the other rate uh, increases, uh, it ends up being a net of about $500,000. Um, on our volume, as I reported, our emergency room has, has seen volumes increase. Um, after the pandemic, uh, imaging volumes, uh, we, we did put some additional uh, revenues in for radiation therapy. Uh, that's, a, that, that, that's a risk in our budget because um, we have had some um, volume declines there. Um, and um, uh, can somebody mute their phone? Yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting here, but whoever is not on mute, please make sure everybody has their audio muted, please. Thank you. Sorry, Steve. That's okay. Um, observation patients, we are seeing uh, greater observation patients. Uh, as you can see, there's nothing for uh, a COVID-19 surge. Um, and then our outpatient routine lab uh, volumes uh, are going down, and that has to do um, uh, just overall with uh, volumes as well as some of our COVID testing. Uh, that's This is all budget to budget. Um, Fixed prospective payment, um, we're looking at about $37 million. Uh, we participate in all the programs. Uh, these numbers were received from uh, uh, OneCare. I do believe there may be a greater shift um, once we get the final numbers. Remember, um, the um, uh, OneCare uh, years are calendar years, so uh, the 37 probably will go up a little, and the 151 will come down a little bit. Um, as more uh, lives um, attribute um, to the model, but uh, we used uh, strictly what we got from the Greenmount Care, uh, from the One Care Vermont, um, um, when we asked them for uh, a projection uh, on what they they saw. Um, so to recap, our budget um, a 6.35 percent increase. Four year trend is about 3.8. Uh, no significant revenues and expenses for another COVID surge uh, due to the uncertainty. Uh, a net charge master uh, increase of 9.5%. And again, non-COVID uh, non related volumes um, were um, removed. And as we took the you know, emergency room and imaging are the big increases to our 22 budget. Um, just moving on, um, you know, to the numbers again, you know, our budget showed a, a small profit, uh, very different than our history. Um, uh, but uh, again, that profit will be challenged and is being challenged. Um, and uh, if I had to submit a budget today, I, I don't think it would be a, a $900,000 um, um, gain from operations with what I know and what we're dealing with every day. Um, high, high level cash flows with a $900,000 gain, uh, our, our cash flow um, is about, is break even uh, at $200,000. So it uh, does not show um, significant um, uh, gain in cash. Uh, it will be a challenging year. If we're if we're even able to hold the operating gain, um, if we can't hold the operating gain, uh, one of the first contingencies and the first things that we have to look at is our is our routine capital purchases, which we have reduced this year from six million to five million, uh, and we will have to look at other um, things as we move through um, the budget year. Uh, but you know it. Each year, you know, while while the graph I showed earlier uh, showed us relatively consistent, uh, each year we had our challenges, and each year we had 
uh, some things uh, that we put in the budget go the right way. Some things we had things go the wrong way. So this team, um, um, you know, from from the housekeepers, um, dietary workers, all the way up to the EMT members, you know, we we've adjusted over the years and 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 met our targets. So. I've lost Steve's audio. Is it just me? Yeah, no, I think I did too. Anybody else know what anybody from the uh, Southwest team know what happened to Steve? No, let me check here. I'm here. Am I here? Okay. Yes, you're here now. Thank you. Some re some um, I where did you lose me? At the beginning, Steve. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, keep going. So, so did we look at statement of operations? We were on the balance sheet yes, when uh, you lost me. Yep. Yeah, you're right here when we lost right you. Right here. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the balance sheet, a lot of numbers. Um, I just, um, you know, um, you know, up here, cash uh, and accounts receivable um, uh, are the drivers to this balance sheet. You'll see that. Uh, plant, property, and equipment, a lot of numbers on this page will be increasing. That's really, really related to our emergency room project. Um, other than that, uh, not a lot of significant uh, changes, um, uh, a little bit change in our, in our long-term debt, uh, but not, not no real significant changes. Um, and uh, um, so, so let's just turn, you know, we talked about revenue. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on our operating expenses. Um, you know, our, our total operating expenses will be 196 million. Uh, budget to budget increase of about 8.5 percent. Uh, when you look at our people cost, uh, it's over 60 percent, nearly 60 percent. Uh, salaries, uh, wages. Uh, you know, we we we. In 2012, uh, 22, 2012, geez, uh, I only wish. Uh, in 2022, we um, um, put about $4 million worth of cost into our workforce. Uh, we continue um, uh, to be planning on doing that uh, this year. Uh, benefits uh, are going up accordingly. We expect uh, uh, increases from our insurance carrier uh, and then our providers through our Dartmouth PSA also uh, going up, you know, and there are challenges and you'll hear, I think you'll hear from uh, Dr. Dobson talking about uh, recruiting related to wait times and, and challenges that we're having um, uh, in on those fronts. But overall, the numbers, you know, uh, a good chunk of our expenses are uh, are uh, related to uh, labor. And, you know, when you back out, depreciation and interest, which is, which is, um, you know, kind of, you know, you know, first of all, depreciation is a non-cash cost in the 196. Um, and then you have your, your, your fixed cost of your interest and your provider tax fixed cost. Um, our, our cash, you know, when you take the 114, you compare it, it gets up to 65, 67% of, of what we do each and every day. Um, so again, um, Repeating, you know, 14 percent increase uh, in our budget to budget uh, um, uh, permanent compensation increases of 4.2 percent. Um, and, um, you know, we did raise our minimum wage uh, last year. We're, 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 we're looking at um, right now, um, you know, maybe that wasn't enough. Uh, because, you know, some of our lower paid employees can go other places to get jobs. Um, and um, we've added some um, uh, monies in there for the in the budget for that, but we may have to give more. Um, and as well as the professional staff. Um, we've seen an increase in FTEs. Due to, uh, we've added some uh, FTEs for the blueprint, and that's a plus minus. Uh, revenue and, and then and then expenses. Um, we we increase some FTEs in the clinical areas due to staffing concerns. And when we're holding another four to five people in our acute care um, unit because we can't move them to the nursing home or we can't transport them to the nursing home, um, 
we still have to take care of those patients. We still have to feed them. The nurses still have to around on them. The nurses are still administering meds. Uh, the hospitalists are still coming in to see the uh, patient. So we've had to increase uh, staffing because uh, our census is up, as well as um, the, the, I'll call it, uh, sometimes we want to call it the post-pandemic. Uh, we, we have, um, uh, our census has been higher uh, not just due to COVID patients, but also due to um, patients uh, just uh, uh, presenting and, ne and needing care. And we did budget uh, uh, just a, uh, a fraction of contracted labor, but, uh, and, and we're, ch you know, our, our goal and, and I know Pam's goal is to uh, minimize uh, the use of outside travelers, uh, both from a quality perspective and a um, cost perspective. Uh, health benefits, as I talked about, will be going up. Uh, we're going to be uh, sharing some of the benefit increases with our employees. Um, uh, workers' comp is going up. We talked about work, workforce violence, um, and workers' comp is uh, um, rates are going up uh, due to that, as well as our, our experience. Uh, and regulatory benefits uh, due to increase uh, as, as, you know, as, as we increase salaries and wages, uh, the regulatory benefits such as FICA, such as unemployment and things like that go up uh, uh, as well. Um, so overall, you know, again, uh, up 8.6%. Supplies, uh, you know, we did put, it, it looks low and it might be low uh, at 5.3, uh, but we challenged our hospital's value analysis team uh, to come up with $750,000 worth of savings um in, in in our budget so there is an initiative there and and the team is compiling uh looking for ways to save money uh and we factored that into our um supply cost uh if not our, our increase would have been uh, greater um but one of the things that is really uh one of their missions is that uh yeah you can get uh lower cost items but we cannot jeopardize the safety and the quality uh, of the care we give uh, here at the hospital. And, and, and in addition to the word safety, you know, we always try to give uh, high quality and safe care to the patients, but we also have to make sure that our employees are safe. Um, and so that's one of their initiatives and they're working hard on, on producing a list of things uh, to do. Drug costs, uh, we, get, we put in 8.8%. Um, and then in our other, um, uh, cost and we put another five hundred thousand dollars of savings. Uh, we're working with all the managers to find things that you know. Sometimes you, when you get contracts, you know I, the example I use is is and I use me as an example. Um, I, I've gotten a report for years here that shows shows me information and um, and is a trend and I use that information to make decisions. This year, I'm shutting that report off because our, our, our trend has been very consistent. I will hold off. I will, I will use the old reports. I will look uh, and, and I, won't, I won't be getting that report. So, and that's a contracted savings that, that we can get. It's not a lot of money, but if everybody does that, uh, we, can, we can save some money. And, um, and so everybody's charged with that. And we have a, a, a team working on it uh, led by Jim Roy. He'll be working uh, with the managers to go through everything that we in, in other costs and purchase services that we do and challenging the managers and, and the team to find uh, at least $500,000 of cost. And that's built into our budget. Other inflationary increases, five to seven, um, you know, this will create risk in the budget, but, you know, again, uh, we challenge our managers to find ways of, of not going, if the, if the cost of the product is going up 10%, you gotta find ways to find an additional 3% and, and challenge them. Some will be successful, some won't. Uh, some, uh, we'll, we'll win on some, we'll lose on others, but we have to challenge because we can't just keep uh, uh, adding cost um, to our uh, cost base. Provider tax, uh, I won't uh, give my editorial comment on that. Um, um, so, so that's the numbers, that's the concept uh, on how we built our budget, right or wrong. Uh, it's a budget, it's a guide. Uh, we know we're going to be challenged, um, and um, 
Uh, as I said, if I was submitting it today, I'd probably be submitting something uh, with uh, some different numbers because uh, it's been, you know, a, at least 75 days since we finalized this and submitted to our board of trustees and things have happened. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Trey uh, go through the equity section of our presentation. Dr. Dobson. Sure. So, yes, I was asked to uh, give uh, some comments and just talk a little bit about diversity, equity and inclusion at SPMC. I, you know, I, I think all hospitals, I hope all hospitals are working extremely hard on diversity because without uh, a, a real strong effort on diversity, we can't fulfill our mission in healthcare, And that's true in many other sectors of society, too, including education. And I'm not going to go through all these bullet points here, but just looking at the first one, we have a very active and growing DEI committee. I don't I don't really want to call it a committee because I think of a committee as 12 people that meet once a month. This is a group of over 40, I think almost 50 people now that that do meet monthly, but also are highly engaged in um, educational activities throughout the month. Uh, and so maybe it's uh, interest group, work group, uh, really spreading the message and actually the ones that are doing the work to improve diversity throughout our system. In bullet three, uh, you can see annual mandatory uh, implicit bias training. I, I think many fields uh, you're aware of, you have to do your annual education things where you click on buttons for slides to try to get them to go away. Uh, we have a lot of that in healthcare for regulatory uh, reasons, but many of them uh, do have an interest and in really the way to get these educational uh, efforts to be appreciated is to have the staff themselves participating, designing them. And that's definitely what happens with our mandatory uh, bias and diversity training to the point where we actually have a lot of fun developing the, the scenarios and then uh, meet after each annual requirement to see how we can improve it for next time. And then you can see the other efforts there linked. Again, I hope all hospitals uh, have similar types of efforts. We, we do talk about them together. The hospitals are, of course, very collaborative and try to learn from each other. Uh, the next to last bullet point is also incredibly important, and that's a community outreach task force to work with the community to see how we can better incorporate uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in all the work we do. Uh, our biggest barrier is uh, probably the same and you would as other hospitals, and you would predict this, and that is just uh, attracting candidates uh, from diverse backgrounds, diverse racial and ethnic uh, backgrounds to our area. And we continue to work uh, diligently on that, as do others. Uh, it's going to take time. And uh, I think the awareness and the will are certainly here. That's a great thing. Uh, but there is an incredibly long way to go, and I can't over uh, uh, estimate that. I hope that we will be in a significantly better position uh, within the next five years. But I know that this effort must continue. Uh, especially when you travel to other locations and other healthcare systems, you know, we are uh, not where we need to be in Vermont. And I'll move on to the next slide. So now different topic there, wait times. Um, I put this slide here, not for really the board, but for others in the audience to make sure we all understand uh, what what is meant by third next available. I know this is in the definitions uh, of the packet material. We've been doing it here in our mostly in our practices for about five to seven years using the uh, National Institutes of Health definition. And, and actually, you're going to hear me talk about some of the limitations, and that's not the point. I do just want to point out uh, to everyone, you know, what some of the barrier, barriers are here when we use any type of measurement in, in health care. Um, you know, I worked Thursday in our emergency department at SVMC and yesterday at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock. And no matter any of the barriers I talk about here in the measurements, one thing's for certain access is not where we want it to be. So let's just call that the principle of the situation. Access is not where we want it to be for primary care or specialty care. Uh, I see it in the patients I take care of. You see it in the community or among your family or yourselves. And so it's something I think we can all agree upon uh, no matter what measurement we're using. How do we get better access? And actually, how do we share that among our health systems so that we're all working together to improve that? So if you can go to the next slide, Steve, just some of the things, just quickly for people to understand, if you did look at an individual health system uh, measurement of third next available, you're gonna see that it 
varies tremendously month to month. And you may want to know why is that? And that's because just when an individual goes on vacation or just when an office uh, introduces a new service or, or actually excludes a service for a small amount of time, it causes these numbers to vary significantly. So I, I bring this up so that you don't focus too much on what is the actual number, but looking at trends and looking at trends at particular health systems. That's really the only way that we can um, you know, make the right effort to improve upon it rather than you know, trying to like uh, squabble on on the different individual measurements. It also varies by individual physician. You can have a physician who has good access for a few months and then poor access or uh, for another few months. It's hard to figure out why it has to do again with vacation scheduling, with office scheduling and the types of patients that individual physician or advanced practice provider is seeing. And then also just for some reassurance, uh, there are many, many patients who get in under that third next available who have urgent needs. Uh, they do have to jump through hoops or they have to be referred by an, uh, another physician. I, this happens to me in the emergency department all the time. I have a patient that needs to be seen again within a, uh, within a few days. Uh, I know that they're not going to be able to get in if they just call themselves. So I have to make that call, speak with the doctor or the front staff directly and just emphasize why this person needs to be seen uh, more acutely. Next slide. So these are just some, these are actually true examples from our own data. Uh, this is the second quarter 2022, and, and it's not the greatest slide, but I tried to put together, we have five primary care uh, sites in our system. Uh, you can see one is called Palinol. Uh, we have a pediatric clinic. We have one called Northshire uh, Family Medicine Clinic. And then on the right-hand side, uh, there's Deerfield Valley, and then there's internal medicine in Bennington. And you can see the third next available in Pownall Pediatrics in Northshire Medical Center are, are actually not bad. Uh, within a week to maybe two weeks uh, that there is a third next available for a new patient uh, to be seen. Now, the thing that's in common with all of these practices right here is we've had recent new hires, new physicians, new advanced practice providers who've come in, uh, you know, within the uh, fiscal year of 2022, and that is what has driven the access uh, to be improved. Whereas the other two locations have not had new physicians or advanced practice providers come in, and their numbers are much higher, you know, up into the 30s and 40s for getting patients in uh, for a third next available new patient. Again, if I need someone or someone needs to be seen uh, in one of these clinics for an urgent reason, we can generally do so within a week. And I think that's a uh, you know, throughout the, the whole state, you'll hear that from other doctor's offices. It still doesn't um, mean that there's no problem with access. In fact, there is an incredible problem with access. I'll go back to it again and say I face it every day when I work in the emergency department and I hear about it in the community and with my own family. So next slide. The same is true. I just want to point out the importance here with new provider hires. These are our specialties, uh, not all of them, but just a select group of our specialties. A lot of this information was you know, put out in the digger uh, when this uh, came up, when the, this issue was really came to the forefront. And you can see that in general surgery and orthopedics, uh, the third next available is, is very small within a week. And that completely has to do with new physician hires, new advanced practice provider hires. Whereas in neurology, where we couldn't find a candid, uh, another candidate, cardiology, dermatology, the numbers are much longer. And let me go to the next slide and just explain why I keep putting these up. It is true, like in any field, um, you have to have efficiencies, and these efficiencies are going to help drive access. Um, just listing just a very few up here, uh, reducing the length of appointments and making them standardized, having um, others do prescription refills and triage rather than the, the doctors themselves that are trying to see the patients or the front staff that are trying to register patients getting scribe services and other initiatives. Telemedicine helps not near as much as we would all like it to, uh, but it does help for some of the services. And then developing same day walk-in clinics. But in the end, um, these efficiencies don't make the difference in access that recruiting in new providers does. If we recruit in new providers, then our access numbers uh, improve significantly. And I think that people see that uh, no matter if they're in a highly specialized clinic like uh, neurology uh, or a family medicine clinic uh, where you see a, a vast numbers of people. And I think that's where we have to continue to focus our efforts as of course we look at uh, improving efficiency throughout the system. And I think that's my last slide, Steve. Okay. Can everybody hear me now? 
Okay, just want to make sure. Um, so each year we give high level risk and opportunities and, and in, in the past, um, we used to give you a list of things, um, but um, I'm going to be a little more macro this year. Um, you know, labor. Labor is um, one of our biggest challenges. Uh, when I look at the budget, um, uh, I, I see the salary uh, number is probably, uh, we're probably going to be over budget uh, in, in 23. Um, and, you know, what we budgeted isn't enough to maintain our stable workforce. And, and I, I'm, I'm leaning to answering that question and saying, no, it's not. Um, Demands on the workforce. Um, you know, Tom talked about uh, work uh, uh, workplace violence. Um, uh, will that will that prompt more individuals to seek other opportunities? Maybe retire early or just leave healthcare. Um, we've had a couple of employees uh, in in non patient care support services uh, just say, you know, uh, it's too stressful in healthcare. Uh, uh, low end, um, um, some, some of the lower paid individuals will go to work at Pizza Hut or, um, or uh, Home Depot um, and they get a little more money and they claim it's less stressful. Um, and so, you know, just to put it in perspective, if we're off 1% of the macro level, uh, it's, in, it's over $600,000, uh, and that wipes out uh, our operating uh, margin that we budgeted. Uh, in 22, I'm going to say we were seven, we're probably, I, I think that number is going to be eight to 9% by the time the end of the fiscal year uh, off in our assumptions. Uh, here's an example. Um, a, a competitor offered a, a, a clinical professional over 50% greater uh, pay. Um, and then what we did was we, we, we looked uh, at, at, at the whole group, at all the clinical professionals in this classification. And uh, we have, uh, you know, we were, um, we, we adjusted the pay. We didn't go up 50% for everybody. Uh, it's an annual cost of $300,000, and by doing this, uh, we were able to retain that employee, uh, which was going to get a 50% increase, but he was going to have to work nights. He was going to have to do 12-hour um, uh, shifts. He was going to have to work more weekends, uh, and uh, he had been a longstanding employee, so we were able to retain that employee, and two employees that gave notice uh, to go to other places uh, were retained. If we didn't retain those three people, we probably would have had to gone into the traveler mode, uh, which would be uh, over 100% increase in pay. Uh, so, um, and, and, and a, a week doesn't go by where HR, uh, the, the area's VPs are not dealing with situations like this. So um, it, is, it is challenging and um, uh, for us. Inflation. Um, you, you heard in, in just at the high levels uh, what we put in our budget, the initiatives that we're trying to save money, uh, trying to find ways, challenging our team. Uh, but um, if we're off 1%, it's between six and $700,000, which the likelihood uh, is, is high. Uh, recent reports show that inflation is, is declining a little bit, so um, we'll see. Um, but uh, uh, I did get a slide deck this morning, which I did not look at from our group purchasing um, uh, main vendor uh, that um, the, the, the low light is, is that um, uh, cost will be going up between eight to 10%. And uh, I gotta go over it uh, before I comment further about it. So uh, COVID is a second significant risk. What is COVID gonna be? Um, you know, um, I've asked Trey numerous times, look in your crystal ball, Trey, you're the clinician. Tell me what the surge is going to look like in the fall. And, um, you know, I, I think he chuckles sometimes and sits there and says, we, we know, uh, when the winter comes, there'll be, you know, some, but how much we don't know. So, uh, we, we didn't take a real big stab at it because it's really a big unknown.
It's a big question mark. And and I think if we said if we said we were going to have a 10 percent surge or a 20 percent surge, um, it, that's all um, we're speculating. So uh, we did not provide that. We will deal with it. We will, uh, you know, like this team, uh, I, I'm very proud of, you know, anytime we, we have something like this, uh, we step up and we'll figure it out. And we'll, we'll, we'll care for, as Tom mentioned, uh, and Mike mentioned, you know, uh, we have, we're here to take care of our community. So we'll figure it out. Um, during the last, um, you know, the past year, we, we, as I said earlier, we, we vaccinated, uh, over 50,000, we administered over 50,000 vaccines. Uh, we tested over a hundred thousand people, uh, and, uh, we, we, we were on the, a leading edge of giving uh, some of the therapeutics, um, so uh, we will we will step up and we will because um, our mission is really to take care of our patients and our community, uh, and and we will continue to do that. Um, the economic environment, uh, as I talked about, managed care companies. You know, the the woman said to me, "We're losing money. Uh, I got I got to find a way um, to to reduce how, what I pay you." Uh, so I, I went over all of these, but these are things that are happening every day and they're not, you know, the old, you know, I'll say the nickel and dime. Uh, these are big numbers, uh, for our organization. Um, so things are changing, uh, faster. Um, I don't have, uh, sneakers, uh, fast enough to keep up with them. Um, uh, and, um, uh, we will keep adjusting and, um, and, and I'm confident that this team will, 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 will do the best we can. And, uh, we will continue to, uh, cre you know, have a safe and high quality, uh, environment, uh, here for our patients and, uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, uh, so Instead of going through all of the individual items on the risks and opportunities, I, I think I think that those those slides really cover what's what's happening in the world today. Value based care. We talked about this earlier. Uh, I won't go uh, too much more into that. Uh, uh, this and our capital. Um, we have a five million dollar capital budget. It's down because we need to. Um, have a positive cash flow, uh, but uh, you know one of the areas if we if we don't meet, meet our budget, uh, we probably will start um, chipping away at this five million dollars from a cash flow perspective. We do have uh, we will be spending about fifteen point six million dollars in the twelve months uh, of the fiscal year on our modernization emergency room project, um, and uh, that is on track uh, to. Uh, uh, open in a timely fashion, um, as, as we submitted in the um, in our CON. Uh, however, costs are going up and, and are challenging. Um, uh, our future CONs, uh, we're, we're looking, um, I think a year ago, we said we were going to submit the Cancer Center CON around now. Uh, we probably will push that back. Um, we uh, just got the cost estimates in. Uh, it's north of the 15 million. Um, and so we're looking at some design uh, changes uh, to try to bring that down. I, I think it's safe to say the $15 million goal that we put in this presentation, uh, we just got the cost last, uh, actually two weeks ago. Um, it, it, it probably will be north of the $15 million. Um, just due to the cost um, increases that we're seeing that Tom talked about it. Um, future possible, but these may have to be pushed back. Uh, in the imaging area, uh, our CT scanner is 10 years old uh, and we have a portable MRI. Uh, it probably would be advantageous to, um, and also improve the quality and, and just having an MRI stationary here. Um, Family medicine residency program um, is is still on the table uh, and modernizing our operating rooms. But immediately the cancer center is our, our next um, big one. Um, so discussion, um, you know, just um, uh, times are challenging. Um, things are changing at a rapid pace and uh, we will do our best to achieve our our. Our, our, our budget as submitted, uh, but there'll be significant challenges.
So I am done from a presentation point of view, Jessica. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and just to kick it off, you know, a sincere thank you to all you're doing to care for the patients in your community and your frontline workers. We really appreciate it. We know it's been a trying year, trying several years, I would say, um, and appreciate those challenges that you're facing and navigating these turbulent waters, um, keeping your head above the water to find cost savings still and to try and, you know, the efforts you've done to retain your employees and improve wait times and focus on equity and diversity and inclusion. So very much appreciated. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll open it up for questions from the board, and I'm going to start with uh, Robin. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. It's nice to see you. And um, I wanted to say thank you particularly for uh, looking for cost savings in your budgets. As everyone has said, these are challenging times all the way around, and I think um, you know, it's really great to hear that you've included that as some target costs. Um, related to the cost savings, I was wondering if you could tell me, do you think that these savings are, would you qualify them as fully achievable, a stretch goal, somewhere in between? I just wanted to get a sense of your thought in terms of picking those as targets. So, so I, I would say that, um, um, I wouldn't call them a uh, stretch, but they're kind of like in the middle of the road, Robin. Um, yep. You know, you, you, you don't want to, you, you always want to challenge your teams um, in, in, in when you set these goals. So, uh, but, you know, with, with the pricing increases we're seeing, it may take away f uh, from some of it, but we're not backing off on it yet. The, the, the team is, is forging ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to add to what Steve said, uh, Robin, on some yeah. of these initiatives, we're also looking, working closely with Dartmouth Hitchcock, who's our affiliation partner, to see how we can, how we can collaborate on some opportunities. So I think you know, something that um, it's, it's it's far from a it's a gimme, but we're going to work very hard to achieve them. Excuse me, please. Court reporting. Um, Robin, could you please state your last name? And the last person that just made a statement, could you tell me who you are, please? Robin, first. Yes, it's Lunge, L-U-N-G-E. Yeah. And yes, hi, that was on Tom D, D-E-E. -E. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the other question, uh, I had a clarifying question around the blueprint for health FTEs um, adding to the budget. Is that due to an increase in blueprint or could you speak a little bit to what's going on there? I'm I'm curious to understand that a little better. Well, there were there were a couple of FTEs added to our budget because uh, we need to um, add some um, staff to maintain uh, the services and uh, to to continue the good work that the blueprint does. Um, so uh, in the in the monies we get for blueprint, we uh, under the contract, um, we added uh, more clinical people um, so we can go out in the community and and, and manage the care and, and reach out and make sure that uh, our community is served. Great. And is, but I guess what I'm trying to get at it is that because the blueprint contract increases or is this on top of the blueprint money you get? This is um, it's a combination of both. OK, great. Okay. Um, in your summary of your workforce challenges in fiscal year 22, uh, you talked about incentives and compensation for staff. Um, to retain staff. And um, you mentioned some temporary salary increases for certain clinical staff. Could you speak a little bit more to that in a little more detail? Um, when when did you institute those? Have they all sunset? If not, when will they sunset? So um, in, in the late fall of last year, um, when COVID was surging um, and we saw some of our staff uh, start entertaining to, uh, to leave us and become travelers. Um, we actually uh, increased 
pay uh, to all of the employees in that job classification in that department uh, substantially in order to keep those employees here um, and, um, and other employees and uh, to keep the travelers out. So some of those um, sunsetted, uh, we, we did it for about three to four months, and then uh, we actually kicked it, um, had to reinstitute it uh, a couple months later because um, we were we had some critical staffing shortages. So in order to um, you know manage our, our resources um, and make sure we had adequate staff, we had to re reinstitute. So we have we have pay codes set up. Uh, and as we, you know, the last the last choice is to call a travel agency. Sure. So so we have these things in our um, in our you know game plan. Um, yeah. And you know some of the things that were permanent, you know, such such as shift differentials, uh, and you know some of the staff we actually as the example I gave in our uh, risks and opportunities where. Um, you know, we actually gave permanent increases. Sure. Okay. So, so those bases have gone up. So, yeah. um, and one of the other things that we did was, which was permanent, was we accelerated our pay. You know, um, increase from last May to to January. So that's a permanent. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, and we're getting creative. You know, uh, we will give. You know, and and this is a temporary thing, but. Uh, shift bonuses. If we're if staffing is really critical, we will uh, on the spot um, give um, incentives to to have people stay on top of their overtime pay. So it's a combination of permanent and and temporary. And, and Robin, this is Tom D speaking. Um, yeah. The area that was we were hit particularly hard last year, as Steve referenced, was the emergency room, where we were facing. Uh, we lost. Um, uh, for for key staff people and uh, numerous other ones who are also contemplating leaving for um, travel agency. So that's that's an area that we focus very aggressively on, but we also had to target other areas as the year went on. Thanks. Um, in terms of, I thought your um, utilization estimates were interesting uh, because we certainly heard in our Qualified Health Plan Insurance Rate Review, um, some analysis around emergency department visits coming back um, as the pandemic, um, as surges fell off. So there seemed to be, at least in the insurance company data, some correlation between the ED utilization and urgent care, as well as imaging and those things. So it was interesting to see that kind of follow in your budgets. Are, do you, what are, are there other areas in the hospital that, um, you are budgeting uh, not that same kind of take up that you would say are still low compared to maybe 2019. I'd just be interested to get a little more detail around um, kind of the trends you're seeing in utilization and how that relates to pre pandemic versus pandemic. So, so Robin, in our budget, we budgeted on the inpatient side, which represents about 20% of our business. Um, we, we budgeted. Um, admissions uh, very much in line with 2019. Yep. Um, and um, length of stay, we creeped up a little bit, but not to where the current levels are. So that's length of stay is how long people stay in the hospital during yeah. the pandemic. They stayed longer. We hope to get back um, to that to those levels, um, but the challenges with transferring patients to nursing homes yes. uh, is is putting a damper on that. Um, so, so we have challenges there. Um, in the emergency room, uh, we are seeing, um, you know, one of the things that we looked at, and and Trey, uh, Trey probably will cringe, but we looked at diagnoses in the emergency room, um, and. Um, uh, from a billing perspective to look to, to build our, our numbers this year. And, um, you know, there's not, um, you know, looking at the data, we anticipate our emergency room to, to continue to go up because the, diag the, the diagnosis that we use for billing, uh, we backed out all the COVID uh, ones that we were able to identify. But I know that COVID's a moving target, uh, sure. even, even in, a, in a stay. So, so we saw those go up. Um, imaging uh, is interesting. Uh, we're seeing imaging go up 
um, and primary care and, and you know, pr our primary care numbers will go up if we're, a if we're successful in recruiting. And as a result, there appears to be more imaging coming. But, um, you know, I, I think Trey will say um, every time we take two steps forward, uh, it seems like we take 1.9 steps back when it comes to recruiting. Um, so um, we're making headway, but not as fast as we would like. So imaging is another area where we've seen uh, increases and, and, and we budgeted that. And, and the other areas where we're kind of holding back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and, and the data is, is supporting that. Lab has been, uh, if you take out the COVID uh, processing, lab has been up and down. Um, and I'm not sure what the trend is telling me there uh, at this point. So we went to the 19 levels um, that, um, you know, pre-pandemic pre uh, levels. Um, will that be right? I don't know. Will, will we be wrong? I don't know. Um, it, will, it, will, it will pan out. Um, over time. And Robin, this is Trey uh, Dobson and Hi, Steve's, exa Steve's exactly right. Just a couple of really quick comments. Uh, emergency department and and urgent care, express care volume increases. Some of that is clearly due to access difficulties with primary care. And you know, mm -hmm. that's that's not just us. That's everywhere. Better primary care access reduced some of those volumes. Uh, the second is since you asked the question, um, general surgery has not rebounded as much as would it be anticipated and, and that's actually not just here at SVMC that's in some other places it's a little bit um, you know it's a little not certain why that is uh, there are some national trends on it but it's starting to slowly go back up and it probably just was an aberration with uh, how that clinical service works um, gastroenterology I think many places around the country are seeing that there truly was a uh, in that particular field, uh, a lot of delay in care that uh, that still lasted beyond 2020 and well into 2021. In fact, it continues a little bit now. So I think the volumes there um, will increase around the state, depending on whether or not there's access at that particular hospital. Uh, and then finally, you know, particular to our institution, oncology services is really, uh, as Steve mentioned, a risk. Uh, both with radiation and chemotherapy um, because cancer rates are, you know, not impacted by the pand pandemic, uh, but our ability to recruit in staff, both physicians and um, support staff is a little hampered. Thank you very much. Um, and that's it for me. Great, thank you. Uh, I guess I'll turn it over to board member Tom Pelham. Or questions. Well, good morning and thank you. I uh, I just kind of want to start off by kind of uh, affirming your very good track record coming into uh, 2023 uh, that uh, I've um, you know with adaptive you can kind of look at a uh, an individual uh, hospital against the entire population of 14 of the 14 hospitals and. <laughs> Just as a couple of top top side numbers that for all hospitals, the NPR FPP growth since 2021 has been 9.2 percent versus um, uh, <clears throat> Southwestern's uh, growth rate of 3.5 percent, and the um, budget over budget, all hospital population is a 10.2 percent increase versus your 6.4 percent increase. Uh, same pattern in uh, expenses, so um, I think the track record is is pretty strong that you're you are uh, work, working very hard to um, you know meet the challenges of the day. My my first question is um, having to do with your value based um, program with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and. Uh, I, I mean, that's been in play now for, for uh, a few years. Um, it is really uh, occupies 99% of all of the uh, value-based efforts aligned with uh, uh, carriers, insurance carriers in Vermont. Um, and uh, so I'm just wondering if you can uh, provide kind of a high level overview of uh, how you view that program. Has it been successful? Why do you think other hospitals and the uh, carrier um, you haven't engaged in in a program 
you know, that 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 you have uh, again at a relatively modest level, four and a half million dollars. But um, it's still the most significant program in the state of Vermont. So, you know, we joined, you know, we're uh, our organization um, early on, Tom, uh, was very committed to the uh, population health. So when Blue Cross, um, when we saw the opportunity after going into Medicare and Medicaid to go into the Blue Cross um, a qualified health plan um, program, uh, we, 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 we jumped on it. Um, and, um, you know, like with like with all of this, it's it's very fluid. Um, and, um, you know, our team, you know, we have um, a, a group, um, I'm going to call it the care coordination team that works very closely with um, one care, analyzing the data and then communicating to the providers. So um, has it been successful? I, I think we're seeing indications that it is, but it, this is a long haul and the pandemic just kind of clouds everything. It makes everything foggy. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're committed to it. Um, it hasn't hurt us financially. Uh, from a, a CFO perspective, um, has it helped us financially? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not willing to go there yet, but it, it's not it, it's not hurting us. So I think we're moving in the right direction. And um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't want to speak for the other CFOs in the state and the CEOs of the state, but but for us, um, it's all part of that progression. Uh, of moving forward, um, because that is, you know, a goal of, of the state and a goal of uh, uh, of our organization is let's move, let's move the bar, let's 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 make you know the cost of care more predictable and and manage it. But you know, with all these other challenges we got going on, it it it, it I may have a different answer a year from now. Okay. But um, I, I, I don't know if that answers your question because it's kind of, you know, my answer is kind of gray uh, right now, Tom, yeah. uh, non-committal. But uh, I, 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 my gut tells me we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, and, and, if, and if we weren't, I'd be in Tom D's office uh, and Trey's office jumping up and down. You know, I, I just I just think it's um, it's one of the pillars of healthcare reform in Vermont fixed prospective payments, um, value-based payments, and you're, you're the leader of it in terms of actually putting it in play. And uh, so I um, I think I read an article in Digger or seven days or something three, you know, the three, two or three years ago that um, basically applauded your program because it allowed you to move a lot of your care into the community and home and, and out of the hospital. So just to the update is appreciated, and I, I can fully understand how um, COVID uh, has a kind of um, cl clouded the situation. My next um, couple of questions kind of have are, are kind of topside questions, but I just want to kind of get your feedback. There's a part of me that feels that um, the provider tax, your your favorite uh, line item, <laughs> that the that the uh, pro provider tax is kind of uh, an error in that they are taxing higher uh, NPR driven by a pandemic. And it just seems, you know, that uh, that hospitals now are are bearing that cost. I think your increase in provider tax for 2023 is over a million dollars, which is big money when you kind of look at what it might mean to your to your um, your margins. And I'm just wondering if, if, if what your reaction would be if there was some momentum developed for a, uh, a cap on the provider tax, say at the NPR levels of 2021 for the next two or three years to give hospitals a little breathing room um, to uh, keep those resources rather than sending them into the state. So Tom, um, um, the provider tax, um, I, I, you know, it's a complicated um, issue for the state because there's matching funds coming in from the feds. But when you look at our, our P&L, 
Okay. Um, it's a cost that each month we have, we send back to the state and in theory, it's built into our rates. The word I said in theory. Okay. Um, and the state, you know, there's matching funds and I don't want to get into, um, I can skirt your question. I don't want to get into all the politics of, of funds, uh, but um, uh, maybe that's a, a, a question for Mike Del Treco and the Hospital Association. Um, but, you know, from an absolute dollar perspective, it is going up. So as a result, I need to be able to um, compensate for that because uh, it's an operating expense and it's and it's going up. So it, we need additional um, rate relief there so um again not a great answer tom but um um it, it's something that um i think we need to take a look at as not, not just the healthcare industry uh, you know the healthcare hospitals the providers but i think the state and and, and i know there's always discussions about this and uh, uh we got to find another mechanism i believe because there, there's there's really no increase uh, budgeted in, in for medicaid um so um and our disproportionate share funds are not going up so um you know um it's 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 a political football that i i i guess i don't want to get into tom it's tom d we support your platform though so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're right there yeah well let's let's just then kind of migrate to medicaid because that my next question was on that connection that uh so here are some facts on the ground or a couple of significant facts on the ground. And um, I mean, you in your uh, budget presentation to us have uh, basically said that your increase in Medicaid is minimal or non-existent. Um, and that's uh, true, I think, across all hospitals. You're not unique in, in that message being sent. And so I look at that and I say, but what are we doing about it or what could be done about it? And so if you go to, for example, the 2023 state budget and look at the um, numbers there for um, the, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, hang on, I'm trying to, the, the global commitment appropriation, it's uh, item number three, the, the, the citation I can give you is is B307 in, in, in the JFO's uh, budget tracking document. That is down um, year over year by $18.5 million. And uh, the rationale for that, uh, according to the um, emergency board, was a drop in caseloads, which makes sense because, you know, now there's, um, you know, people reaffirming incomes and and, uh, ca and caseloads have dropped. But still, it's $18.5 million that was in the budget in 2022, state budget, that's not in the budget in 2023. And I'm just wondering, um, do you think we've gotten to the point where just the cost shift is accepted as a fact of life and uh, it's just is what it is and, and, and hospitals have to work around it? Uh, yes. How's that for an answer? We got to work around it. You know, one of the things that, that, um, I wanted to put in my presentation, but I, I, I didn't I didn't go there was if you if you take the population um, and, and, and let's assume that 50 percent of the population is Medicare, Medicaid. And 50 percent of it is commercial so you get no pay and the cost to the hospitals are going up. Let's pick a number eight percent. But if the government side of the equation is going up, Medicare is going up, the IPPS is going up 4%. Medicaid is going up 1%, maybe, okay, in, in, in the budget, you know, the, what I submitted. Um, the other side of the equation um, has to pick up more. I'm talking about the cost shift, Tom. Uh, so think about it. If, if, Cost overall are going up 8%, but one half of the equation is going up only, and let's just assume four. That means the other side of the equation has to go up 12 just to break even. Okay, so, so it's kind of 
you know, I, I, I've said this now for a long time. The cost, the cost shift is, is a monster. Uh, and um, it, you know, but how do I pay that 8% increase? And, and what we're trying to do with um, the fixed perspective model, perspective payment, is to try to manage the care. OK, and try to move people into, a, you know, so they don't come into the emergency room and see Trey with 10 problems. Hopefully we can manage them in the doctor's office and manage care. And, and that's that's sort of the, the secret sauce that we still haven't gotten to. But uh, when it comes to Medicaid, I, you know, I, I, and we haven't received any kind of real increase, but. I, I probably some of that reduction might be related to the one care initiatives um, and, and trying to um, treat patients in a lower cost setting and keep them healthier so they don't come into the, the ED where Trey has to see them with multiple um, health issues, which then they get admitted for, which is one of the most is probably the costliest spot f for care. I don't know if that was helpful, but um, it it. D d there is some out of balance going on. Well, I, I mean, the, the fiscal imbalance is clear, and but the energy to fix it, you know, is 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 is, is what I was talking about. You know, just trying to trying to get a, a, a visceral understanding of that. I was fascinated by the fact that you have taken a no travelers route by by and large. That was the message. You know that that I got that uh, that and you can see it in the other hospital budgets. Travelers, 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 travelers. Inflation, 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 inflation. Um, but your presentation is not uh, reside on um, a lot of travelers. And I'm wondering uh, and 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 trying to you know prevent that money from leaving the hospital and going to a a traveler agency and keeping it in town. You know to take care of your people. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you've talked to any of your peers um, across other hospitals, uh, whether in Vermont or not, you know, that you can get a sense about your turnover rate. Um, do you, you, you did profile in one of the slides, a, a, I think, a turnover rate. And I'm wondering if you have any sense that that turnover rate is more favorable um, than, than the others that other hospitals are experiencing, some kind of benchmarking about the the course that you have taken relative to the the course that other hospitals are taking you know tom tom d i i don't <clears throat> i i don't think we really have data on the other hospitals to be honest uh I mean, i've had a lot of anecdotal conversations with other ceos and it, and it, it's just, it's just a, you know again i'm not saying what's right and wrong it's our strategy and um it's yet to be determined long term if it was the right move or not, but because um, we've we've made adjustments when also a num number of adjustments have been embedded into our, our salary structure, so we're carrying them going forward. But I we just think philosophically, it makes more sense to invest in our staff, and um, and and it doesn't work by the way unless you don't unless you have a man a nursing management team like ours that steps up and and fill some of the gaps. So um, that's that was a tremendous show of support by our leadership there to do that. Um, but, you know, can we do this all the time, year after year? I'm, I'm not sure. But um, so far, I think it's worked well. Our, our vacancies, you know, we're running about 8% vacancy, which is high for us. We don't usually, you know, our nurse vacancy rates one of the lowest in northern New England. So, you know, creeping up to 8% is high, but um, so I think so far it's worked in our market for our hospital. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it works up in Burlington or anywhere else. It's, it's, I think it's specific to the organization and, and we have an, a history here through our magnet program of trying to continue to um, cultivate and build our nurse um, model. Um, and it's been a, a positive one. But this is a real test. And um, so I'd say, you know, we have to, it's still, we're still taking a wait and see attitude in terms of how it plays out. Well, I, I think, I mean, I'm glad we're starting with Southwestern. And I think as we go through the other hospitals, uh, you know, I've noticed vacancy rates and turnover rates, you know, in most every hospital presentation. And 
but I don't have a sense of, you know, kind of what the spread is. Um, and uh, we'll kind of uh, keep tabs on that as we go along. Uh, finally, um, so your con the construction fund, I think that's that you've mentioned is not in your domain. That's in in this in, in the organization that you, you you're aligned with. Um, and I'm just wondering if uh, if if that fund um, is under stress, you know, given um, and, and that and that it's a stress point we can't see because it's it's not in, on your books. Um, is uh, but do you have any sense that 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 fund is holding up pretty well? So um, if you're talking about the funding of the ED project. Yeah. Um, our fundraising has been, um, you know, we're, we're over $16 million of fundraising related to the project. Uh, some of the cash that has been received, um, we have transferred and we have kept as liquid as we can, but uh, I wouldn't, uh, uh, to be totally transparent, uh, it did take some hits in the beginning of the year, uh, but uh, we have a, a cash drawdown plan uh, so most of those um, investments are sitting, uh, not all of them, but most of them are sitting in short term um, investments. So they're not taking uh, some of the hits we took in June and also to be totally transparent, didn't get the pickup we got in July. OK, so um, so, you know, wherever you have money, it's under stress today uh, compared to where it was a year ago. Um, but um, we are continuing to fundraise, uh, and uh, uh, those funds are available, as well as um, the construction fund, because uh, we did uh, refinance our existing debt and took out some a new debt. Those funds are all in short term, um, and so they're not gaining anything, but they're not losing. Well, thank you for that, and I'll turn the mic back to um, back to Jess. Hey, Tom, this is Trey. Just real quick to your question before that, I, I did want to emphasize um, it as as Tom said, it does depend on your situation, your circumstance and your location as far as staff turnover. Um, but certainly a, a prime focus and priority on staff safety and well-being is uh, what drives retention. Well, I mean, well, I mean, I, I've heard stories about conflicts between Traveler staff and regular staff, so it's uh, you know it's it's just uh, an arena where you've you've taken a different course, and it might be the best course, and it's just something we should keep an eye on. Thank you. Great. With that, I'll turn it over to Board Member Tom Walsh. Thank you, Jess. Um, good morning, Tom, and we've had a, the pleasure of talking. And good morning, Steve and Trey, who I haven't met yet, but I look forward to. Um, it's been a real um, pleasant opportunity to look through your budget submission and see the performance um, performance year over year. Some of the fellow board members have said um, a few things already about how you've addressed uh, workforce shortages. I think that's great. I also heard in your presentation about negotiating with an insurer who threatened a big cut and being able to explain your situation. Um, and I, I think your approach to presenting today has just been clear, straightforward, and with humility. And I imagine that that helped in that negotiation as well. Um, as others have said, other board members, I think your approach to finding savings with your contracts and with suppliers and engaging the whole staff, um, that seems like a very wise move. I do wonder, um, do you anticipate those um, lasting or are they are you anticipating one time savings from those type of efforts? So the, typically um, there'll be some one times and 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 there'll be some lasting savings. OK, uh, and some of the one times may just hit 2023, but um, we are um, I would really like. OK, uh, but I will take the one time. I will really, I would really like um, 
a long-term savings, but uh, things do change. Uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll evaluate each of them. And, and we do put them, we do put them in those categories here internally. Um, so when we're doing some um, forecasting, you know, and, and let's just say we get $250,000 of one time, $250,000 of, of long-term, you know, we'll put that in our financial model uh, moving forward. And, um, and then, and then there's always something that comes out of left field. Yes, um, that you, you can't anticipate. So uh, both pluses and minuses. Yeah, there's, there's hey, always Tom, um, let me just add in Steve's comments too, and it's good seeing you again. Um, I think part of our, our longer term strategy, which does not play out in this budget, is that we are moving into a relationship with Dartmouth Hitchcock that we think systemically could create some opportunities that could create savings as we retool and re-engineer our operations. So I think that's the, you know, what we're trying to do now is work through a, a single year budget and a budget crisis, but longer term, I think we have to figure out how we can run our healthcare system differently. And I think that's where hopefully over time we'll generate some opportunities for the savings that could generate to all Vermonters. Yeah. I appreciate that, Tom. And I think, yeah. Um, you talked about some uh, system-wide uh, interconnections and collaboration to address access issues. Um, and I think that, that it sounded like that may even extend to some, um, you know, it sounds like potentially collaborating with competitors. And I think that that's a, that's a, a, a good thing given the crisis that we're emerging from. That's how we get through crises. Um, similarly, I think it, I might have heard, maybe I misheard, but it sounded as though there's an opportunity for um, folks on staff, uh, clinical professionals on staff, to work as travelers and then return. So you could imagine that uh, some portion of a workforce moving to wherever the biggest need is in the state for a short period of time and developing a collaborative model for getting through um, surges essentially um, because we may be facing them uh, once or twice a year for a long time um, a quick note about the the third next available appointment i've worked with that figure quite a bit with some work with the va and also at dh a long time ago um, yes it's highly variable the only thing worse is next available appointment which, which jumps around a whole lot more so it's it's um, it's a weird measure until you start to think about how do we find a stable measure to monitor over time. So please keep up your efforts there. I think the collaborative approach, again, the humility that you um, presented with, it's just impressive. And I, it all comes back um, to me, and this is more a comment than a question, right? But um, we're seeing in our healthcare system rising prices leading to rising premiums, leading to patients facing higher out-of-pocket expenses, and then foregoing care. And they're also facing rising prices across the board, right? not just in their health care. So when they do come to us, it's more urgent. They're more stressed, frustrated, likely to become angry with us. They're less likely to be able to pay and so our uncompensated care rises, which we've tended to address, not specifically you all, but in healthcare, we've tended to address by raising our prices again. This is a bad cycle, right? And um, we need the way, I think, Steve, your approach, um, we might disagree on whether to, to name this phenomenon that you talked about with, with board member Pelham, we might disagree about whether it's a cost shift or price discrimination, but I think you really hit the nail on the head with the secret sauce you described. The way to through that is to really look at the delivery system, right? And, and how can we look to keep care out of the hospital in less expensive locations? Um, 
organizations in different parts of the country do make choices to try to develop care systems and engage with the community so that they can predictably make a margin even with Medicare rates. Right. Right. So it's a choice to either play victim to a cost shift or to look at how do we address this reality that we're that we're in. And I just want to commend you for that secret sauce you laid out. I hope a lot of other people are listening because you hit the nail on the head, regardless of what we call the the underlying phenomenon. Oh. Um, yeah, just I'm glad that we started with you folks. It's been impressive listening to you. Um, you can tell that you're committed to trying to keep people healthier and your budget shows your internal efforts to try to keep the price increases uh, to slow the growth. Right? And um, hopefully more people are listening. Uh, so thank you very much. Back to you, Jessica. Great, thank you. Um, so I do have a couple questions. Uh, I'm going to start out with the, the charge master rate increase uh, of 9.5. And we know that the charge master increases don't necessarily translate into one for one increases in what, I'll, what we'll call the effective commercial rate, right? Since it depends on the payer contracts in your portfolio. So I'm wondering if you can shine light for us on what that historical relationship between charge master rate increases and what an effective commercial rate, you know, your best estimate of what the experience would be for your average so, coming to SBMC. So, um, Jessica, um, if you if we look at the, let's use the 9.8 percent that um, um, we we're asking for in this um, budget cycle, um, the effective rate probably would range between, I'll say, 7.8 seven five and eight point five five i just did it quick on my 10 key tom um because <laughs> he likes that i use my calculator from last year's budget presentation so I remember that. um th that's a quick and dirty and, I, and I'm, I'm gonna sit there and say and that's probably in the in the um um 90 percent of our contracts that's perfect. Okay. That's what I um, to know. Yeah. And um, you know, there's probably an outlier higher, and there's probably an outlier lower. Sure. Um, That's helpful. And can you talk a little bit about your leverage, your bargaining power um, in the negotiations uh, with national carriers versus Vermont-based carriers? I'm not sure I have much leverage. With either. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's coming down to um, I, I I don't I don't feel like I have um, you know in talking to this this one um, and it's a small um, managed care organization, their uh, the negotiators focused on one thing is their bottom line. They lost money last year. They lost money the year before, and they can't lose money again. Um, and so this is a, uh, I'll call it a, a, a ground war almost, you know, weekly calls, trying to find angles. Um, with the, the, the United Healthcare, oh, I didn't want to mention anybody's names, uh, but uh, they're a national. Um, they have not been um, as unreasonable as sometimes um, people make them out to be. And uh, our local, um, I, I believe the local organizations um, that are engaged with the One Care Vermont model are, they try to work with us. Um, but they also have demands and bottom lines that they got to meet. And as, as Tom, I think, said uh, earlier, you know, um, it, it, it's just, you know, it's a, there's a, it has to be a balance. Sure. Um, so, um, and, and I've never felt in my 30 years as a CFO uh, that I've ever had leverage on an insurance company, <laughs> you know, when I negotiate with them. Uh, but, you know, if, if we focus on the patient and, and, and our customers, uh, you know, I, I, I feel the pain at times of, you know, being a consumer when I see things go up um, with my plan. So, 
you know, that's the balance that that um, we, we we try to try to do, and and and, and we work with them. Uh, so I could probably well, hunt it. to our world, Steve. Yeah. That is the balance we're trying to achieve every yeah. day here. Yeah. That same but I'm a customer, you know, I, I use healthcare and I'm a customer uh, to, too. And, and, and I see what's going on and, you know, I scratch my head sometimes. Um, well, I appreciate that you wear both hats. Um, so when we, we hear from carriers that those rates are applied, you know, sort of across different service lines in different ways. And in fact, you know, some reimbursements may go up rates may go up, some reimbursement rates may go down to achieve whatever the overall average rate increase might be. And I'm just wondering how you choose, you know, that allocation of rate increases or in some cases decreases. Is it is it margin? Is it volume? Is it market competitiveness? I mean, just to ha what is the criteria that you're using to sort of say, hey, let's, you know, increase X service by 10%, but this, only, this service by only five or something? So, um, as I reported um, for many for many years, um, I, I I try to pull down all my competitors' um, charge masters and try to do comparisons, and I try to see where I'm high and where I'm low. Mm -hmm. um, and what I try to do is for the high ones, I try to pull it down, and then for the low ones. So if I come down ten points on on a high, this is an example. Okay. I may pull two lows up five, okay, um, to try to to try to balance it, because I don't want somebody leaving my market, okay, and going to get care because they're focused on the lows, okay, and 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 they're leaving um, because care given, you know, outside of our service area for services that we do. I know at the end of the day, ultimately, it'll be more expensive. Okay, but if there's a if there's some service lines that I'm low that I'm low on, I want to pull them up. Um, and if the ones that I'm high, where the people are leaving, I want to pull them down to keep them in. Um, so we look at. You know, I get as much data as I can, and we try to do comparisons. Is it perfect? No. OK. Um, and sometimes it's onesies, twosies. Sometimes I find out that um, a procedure done it at Troy was five hundred dollars and we're charging a thousand. So I'll, I'll go to that one, look at the volume. And sometimes I may only do one or two of them or five of them. And OK, you've got to make the decision. Uh, but other, you know, so the big volume ones, I, I try to balance. Um, okay. And, and, and in the One Care Vermont model, uh, overall, I am I am 100 percent confident, let's say 99.99 percent confident that if we do the service here in the One Care Vermont model, 99 percent of the time, it's cheaper than when people leave to go to New York State or they go to Boston or things like that. If we can do it home, I can I can. Uh, almost guarantee that it will be cheap. The, the cost of care will be cheaper. Okay. For the services we do. And, and, and that's a real important thing for the services we do. Um, and if we can keep it home, I, I, I think we also deliver uh, as an organization, uh, high quality care. That's helpful. And, and, and Jessica, you, you know, the answer here, but where we face a real challenge is the freestanding centers in the New York area that just, and many times can you know cherry pick and they have you know um you know we they don't pro provide a 24 7 you know coverage that we do and those are tough to compete with i mean to be very honest those those imaging centers and others that just um have high volume and they um have you know limited access and 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 what's important to know about what tom just said uh 25 of our business or thereabouts depending on how you want to measure it comes from New York State. Okay, another eight to nine percent comes from Massachusetts. Um, helpful. Um, so one of the at some point, maybe, but not today, it would be interesting to know what the Medicaid reimbursement rates are for those other states relative to Vermont. But I, I don't want to do that today because it's not going to we can't change that. Um, 
One of the things that struck me actually about your narrative, and I really wanted to ask about this, was because most of the, it was 340B, so most of the hospital narratives referred to tremendous potential for lost revenues from all the manufacturer restrictions on 340B. And, uh, you know, I know there's been a recent Supreme Court ruling that may, you know, mitigate some of that. And I know Biden's been trying to find some manufacturers for their restrictions and all that. So there's a lot of uncertainty around that. But what struck me about your narrative was well, you were the only one of the only ones, if maybe the only one, highlighting improved capture of 340B revenue. So I wanted to know talking about secret sauce. What is your secret sauce? So, and is there something that we can, you know, that other hospitals might benefit from given all that uncertainty and downside potential for revenue so, loss? So, so Jessica, uh, we have uh, stressed in our last uh, three presentations, the downside of 340B. Yeah. Right. Uh, we also um, are under a special, um, um, when in March the bill was passed that um, we lost our qualification for 340B, if you remember in last year's presentation. Um, however, the legislation came through, I believe it was in March, that extends it through uh, December 31st for us. We now, we now re qualify because the pandemic had, you know, the, the mathematics of the formula had um, knocked us out because of the pandemic. Um, we're, we're as of today, if if the fiscal year ended today, we would requalify uh, into the 340B program. Um, so all all of the the what the other um, uh, hospitals talked about about the manufacturers are, is still here for us. However, okay. um, I didn't. That's stress the requalification it. that allows you to recapture. It's not something no, different about how no. you're. Data. I understand there's data reporting and there's different yeah. mechanisms by which you can still. So, so all the issues with the manufacturers and and the attack on 340B are all re still relevant, but they were in my past three years presentation, so I, I didn't I didn't dwell on it. Um, it. You know, and and we are requalifying, and but what we were able to do this year is get uh, more uh, with some data cleanup working with um, a new intermediary that helped us. Uh, but this is, you know, that's a one-time pickup. And there's, there's, you know, we'll pick that up, but then, then there's going to be the manufacturers chipping away at it sure. again. So um, I probably was, um, I probably should have put it in my presentation and, and put it in my narrative, but uh, I felt like I was, um, uh, beating a dead horse because it was in, you know, the previous years. Uh, uh, so we did have an increase and we're hopefully going to hold that increase, but that's another risk. Uh, and the 340B is, you know, it's a $5 million benefit to the hospital each year. Okay. At least. So 340B being under attack uh, constantly, it's, it's a constant risk to right. us. Uh, and uh, the manufacturers pulling things out uh, is another risk. Yeah. Totally understood. I was just hopeful that you had found some some path forward that that might shed light on. on no, not problem. not much as Tom put okay. it. Secret sauce uh, that I uh, <laughs> want you to have. Uh, well, you got secret sauce with travelers. I thought you had secret sauce with 340B. You know, I just thought if you go first, this is wonderful because we can share the secret sauce. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, uh, another question, and I. I, I also understand the throughput issues, and we're hearing it from all of the hospitals this year. This issues continued issues. This is not a new issue. It, it might be exacerbated this year. I think um, probably related to workforce shortages and the in the in the nursing homes and all of that. But the challenges and costs related to mental health borders and also transferring patients to post acute settings. And I think just as I'm going to put this in a parking lot, but a, it's a request of you to help us think about as a state, I think we need to start tracking those costs as we move towards long-term sustainability planning. And you had given in your presentation an estimate of, you know, the $1 million simply for the transferring of patients to post-acute settings. That $1 million translates into a rate request, right? I mean, we can, we can, we can track those dollars. Yeah. We can start to see how much is it increasing commercial rates? How much is it increasing you know, premiums because we're unable to to solve these bottlenecks. 
um, in our system. And that's where the long term sustainability planning has to come in is to understand where are those bottlenecks and what do they cost? Uh, so I guess what I'm just going to put a stick a little pin in is it sounded like you've already kind of got an estimate of at least the back of the envelope estimate of the uh, the the patients trying to seek you know post acute care and not being able to place them. But there's also the boarding issue, right? yes, the health and all that. So I just want to ask, you know, would there be some momentum from all the hospitals to to, to do that? Is to quantify it on an annual basis and also tell us what is that translating into commercial rate increases that we might be able to, if we fix the system, bring down. So is I, that I, a possible calculation? Obviously not for today with your with your <laughs> calculator in front of you, but is this something that is possible to quantify? I, I believe it's possible. Okay. Uh, and I would, um, maybe it's something that uh, the Green Mountain Care Board um, the hospital association and some of the CFOs uh, could get together to come up with a methodology and uh, uh, to do it. Um, I, I would suggest that we keep it uh, high level uh, and different hospitals have different systems. So we got to do it at the macro level because uh, uh, if we get too micro, then you get too many variations. Right. Yeah, no. Definitely for a, for a future conversation, but you sparked my interest yeah. in trying to yeah. figure out how to how to get around that. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I'm just about done. I have a couple of quick, uh, more like follow up, and I guess I would just say this is what I'm going to ask every hospital. So just asking you, even you touched on it in your presentation, but I'm going to standardize and ask all hospitals, which is, you know, since the budget su submission, if you could share any known or likely changes to federal and state payments relief funds, donations, grants, anything unexpected in Medicare, or Medicaid reimbursement rates, um, if you would follow up with our hospital budget team with just anything that falls into any of those categories, uh, looking for both known and likely changes. So, so that, go so ahead. So Jessica, um, I'm going to, I'm going to take your question and make it a little bigger. Okay. Okay. So yes, um, I think the IPPS uh, for Medicare came in higher than 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 I budgeted. Okay, um, but I will tell you on the downside, as I as I said earlier, um, the the government payer shift looks like it's larger uh, right. based upon my past three four months. Um, on the other side of the ledger. Um, I do know that I had to. I had to. I have three hundred thousand dollars worth of additional cost in my salaries that we executed just the other day. So um, I'm sure everybody will have pluses and minuses this year. Um, so we we just can't focus on the pluses. Understandable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So sure. there's there's both sides of the ledger, and. Uh, you know we need to be fair and balanced, but uh, yeah, I can I can put together something uh, for the uh, for the team. Um, That'd be great. And uh, I would suggest maybe maybe I I, I can put something together, but maybe uh, would the team and Sarah and her team maybe kind of put together maybe a little template what you're interested in looking at. Because I may send it to you in one form, another CFO will put it in another form, and and I'm just. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. No, that's is that good. is that fair? Yeah, I'll talk to Sarah about that. But okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. I, and I'll be willing to talk to Sarah about my thoughts on it. Yeah. Um. And then I guess the the last thing that I just noticed was in, in the budget guidance we had hoped for some information about occupancy rates for both licensed and staff beds as well as average daily census data. It was I think in section under utilization. I don't have the guidance in front of me. I didn't see it in the narrative, so I'm wondering if there could be follow up um, sure. on that as well. And then sure. the other piece, and this is actually probably um, Dr. Dobson, I appreciated your wait times information. Um, didn't see anything about referral lags, and I recognize that that may be something that your systems don't have, you know, currently in place this year to be tracking. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of put a. a probably more for future re reference, but that's a really, in my mind, really, really important measure as well as the visit lag in the sense that, you know, I can personally, my own experience, I waited three months for somebody to call me after a referral was made just to schedule a procedure that then took another three months, right? So we may measure a three-month visit 
lag from when the appointment is made to when the appointment is scheduled, but there actually was three months before that, before that referral was made, uh, or actually scheduled. So I just want to throw out there that I think it'd be really helpful as we look going forward, you know, for next year's budget cycle is to start to think about how we can track those referral lags as well as the visit lags and um, in our processes. So just wanted to throw that out there if that would be helpful to think about for next year. Okay. Um, are there any questions from board members that you just want to circle back to? Is there anything from a board member that's everybody is good? OK, then given that it's 11 o'clock, uh, I'm just going to, if there's no objections, say let's take a 10 minute recess so that folks can have a bio break as needed. And we come back, our staff will, I'll, I'll open up an opportunity for our staff to ask any questions and then we'll turn it over to HCA uh, questions. So why don't we say we'll be back at 11.05, if that's okay with everybody. All right, thank you. So at that point, I'm just gonna offer it up to our staff if they have any questions. Um, Sarah, Russ team. Uh, hello, good morning. This is Sarah Lindberg, head of the hospital finance team. Uh, the team has consulted and we do not have any questions. Uh, thanks for a very clear presentation and uh, transparent process. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. So, Je Jessica, can I just make a comment uh, since Sarah, um, you know, Sarah, I just uh, want to commend you and your staff. Um, lines of communication have been excellent during this whole process. and. Uh, um, even though and and Sarah has my email address, she has my office phone number and she has my cell phone and uh, we've had uh, a good lines of communication and thank you uh, for your efforts. I know the first year, you know, uh, but thank you. Thank you. Well, that is great news to hear. I'm glad those communications are going smoothly. Um, with that, I think I'm going to open it up to Mike Fisher a little earlier than we intended, but uh, or Sam, I suspect Sam, I see you on screen. So are you the designated healthcare advocate person today? Yeah, I will start us off with questions that I will transfer over to Mike. Um, so yeah, good to be with all of you. Sam Peich, Health Policy Analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, so yeah, I think we're ahead of time. We'll do our best, of course, to keep within the time. Um, but our first question is for Southwest is please describe your plan to come into compliance with the provisions of Act 119. Just as a reminder, this is the patient financial assistance bill that was passed in the last legislative session. What obstacles do you expect to encounter as you begin these required changes and how do you plan to address them? I know in your submission you said you hadn't changed your policy recently, so just wanted to ask you to respond to that. So, um, you know, um, my mic, yeah, my mic's on. Um, it passed uh, just a little over a month ago. Um, our revenue cycle team has been uh, reviewing it and um, ha will be uh, making recommendations to uh, myself uh, and then the Board of Trustees um, on modifications to the plan. Um, a couple of the things that um, the team identified. Uh, currently, our, our policy talks about our service area. Uh, we would need to update the policy to uh, the uh, entire state of Vermont. Um, we also have uh, to, um, you know, we also do give uh, free or discounted care to residents in Massachusetts and New York when they present themselves. Um, so we would probably um, you use the same standards and the same levels, um, you know, um, uh, and, and our team's pretty proactive. Um, there'll have to be some changes to the um, um, household threshold, uh, the whole household income thresholds uh, in our policy. Um, and uh, our team has outlined those. Um, and um, you know, um, so, you know, they're they're on top of it. Uh, I think we've demonstrated in the past that you, we're usually early adopters. Uh, we did not provide uh, in the 2023 budget um, um, additional funds if if necessary in charity care uh, for early adoption. So we may have to um, 
hold off on some early adoption, uh, but we will uh, evaluate that. And, and like I said, our team is 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 on it, and um, um, we will um, we will proceed and be in compliance by um, implementation date, which I believe is July first of twenty four. Thank you for that. Related to your DEI work, I'm wondering, this is a different type of question, more in the health equity space. I'm wondering if your hospital conducts any training focused on racial bias and testing and treatment protocols, specifically those related to pain treatment and pain tolerance. So Sam, I, I can't recall that um, that 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 specific um, narrative is, is is actually in our training. I can certainly look. Um, I think that's a great idea. We we definitely look at bias across all of the the treatment, uh, actually from the from the door to the treatment. Um, I can't I can't really say specifically whether pain is not it, pain is in there, and I will look at it and and get back to you and incorporate make any changes. I'll bring it to the to the huge huge committee and, and have them do it because they're so good at it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. This is in more of the affordability and access space. Uh, so given what we know from the Vermont Household and Health Insurance Survey, 47% of the adult Vermont population is either commercially underinsured or uninsured. And I'm wondering if your institution calculates or estimates an inflection point under which the community you serve begins to no longer afford the care they need or they seek deferred care or less care. Well, I don't think there's a actual calculation. But what we try to do is um, try to, you know, we, we, well, going back to Jessica's question earlier uh, in the presentation, um, I like to keep our charges and our cost below other Vermont hospitals and, and definitely below New York uh, hospitals because uh, of uh, where we are. So is it perfect? No, but I think um, I know that um, if if we treat the patient, um, there's a good chance it's the, it's, it's a low cost option. Uh, so there's no fancy formula. You know, I can I can start um, pointing to benchmarks on where we are compared to uh, other Vermont hospitals, uh, where we are compared to other New York hospitals. But um, you know, uh, it depends on the individual as well. Uh, but uh, I, I, I I'm confident that. Most of the time, um, we have high quality and low cost, which is kind of like the formula that we're all striving for. Thank you. And based on identified community needs, some of which you document in the last community health needs assessment that you did in 21, I'm wondering if you have any plans to work with local organizations to improve housing, food access, and or transportation for folks. Uh, I know this is, I mean, uh, Mike Del Treco spoke a little bit about how hospitals are going, some of them are going beyond just the kind of direct vision of care model, which I think is good. So I'm wondering if you could speak to those activities if there are. So, so yes, yes, yes. Uh, housing, housing is a big um, uh, concern for us in our area, both for our employees recruitment as well as uh, the general community. So uh, we have uh, in the past, before the pandemic, we had a program where we were we would renovate some houses and then uh, work with either our employees or outside people uh, to buy the house uh, who couldn't afford houses and work with the local bank and, and do things like that. Um, when it comes to food security, uh, I know we're actively involved in that. Uh, I don't have all the details. Um, I don't know if Trey, do you have any um, firsthand knowledge, but I know our planning uh, director of planning and um, is involved in, in food security. Uh, Trey, do you have any specifics? You know, just that we have a coalition, um, as do many communities, of over 60 uh, um, groups that work on various aspects of community health and certainly food service and food uh, scarcity is a part of it. Bennington College has also been doing quite a bit, and so we've been engaged in their efforts. I um, mean, it's really, you know, not something just the hospital works on, but we all work on uh, collaboratively. I, I don't have the specifics or stats to um, yeah. to present, but I can say that there's a high interest and it's good to keep it on the radar and appreciate you bringing it up. Well, just to add to that, too, I mean, as Trey said, the, the Bennington College Initiative, we are working with, we're part of um, 10 different um, groups that got a $2 million grant to work on, to work on, uh, 
food insecurities, and it's really developing a number of case studies there right now. Um, and of course, as 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 um, Steve alluded to, Healthy Homes was the initiative that we did in terms of if, uh, taking the stressed homes and renovating and, and going back to the um, community through our workforce or others. And, and a big, a very big initiative is, is the Putnam Block project downtown Bennington, which um, first phase of it um, created um, an additional 35 um, homes and apartments, um, of which uh, there's an allocation has to be for um, people at need to, to address their um, problems for housing. And then also we're doing Putnam Block 2, which the plan is for 50 additional apartments we'll be creating online. So, you know, we've, we've been both a, a partner in that, an investor, and now we're also a tenant. So we're very engaged in that process and in our Bennington region. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, sorry. Did you want to add to that? Um, just to follow up to that, is One Care Vermont involved in any of these efforts? And if so, how are they involved? Hmm. That's a good question. I know our care teams talk about uh, with the One Care Vermont uh, uh, care teams uh, talk about food security and, and, and some of the social economic issues that some of the patients have. So um, I don't have any specifics, but I do know it gets discussed. Thank you. Uh, last question from me before I turn it over to Mike. Uh, I just wanted to provide an opportunity for you to respond to our question regarding if you had a high level contingency plan about how your hospital would amend your business strategy if the board reduced or denied your charge request for this year. So, um, you know, as I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, our budget is already at, at significant risk. So uh, one of the things that 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 we'll start making it we'll start making adjustments. Uh, we'll look at some services. We'll look at our capital budget. Um, but you know the, the most important thing that 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 we we got to keep in mind is the people we serve. Um, and I think Mike Del Treco said it. We don't make widgets. We we treat individuals. So uh, we have to maintain our level of high quality and a safe environment. So um, we'll figure it out, okay? It, we may not have a profit. We may not have the 3% operating margin target we wanted, but we will figure it out um, because our, our mission here is to make sure, you know, we, 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 we treat our community and provide uh, services to our community. So we'll figure it out. And, and it's probably going to be a combination of things. Uh, it's not going to be just one thing. It, we will figure we will figure it out. Tom, would you like to add anything? Well, um, I think it's just important to note that you know we, we don't provide a lot of esoteric services here. I mean, we, we are a community hospital, and I think you know we do a, a pretty good job. But when you start to see budget erosions you start seeing an overall degradation of services. And that that's that's kind of the insidious part. I mean, when we, when you don't get the level of reimbursement you need, you can see, you can start to do a gradual cutback, which impacts many, many people, you know, and, and service, you know, the service that we provide is not as stellar. Um, and you know it impacts our community and you start to see it in our healthcare indicators of quality. You see it in serious safety events. You see it in how we, we do with our, our, our um, patient satisfaction surveys. And, and we watch those very, very closely. You know, you know, Trey and his team are on top of that on a constant basis. So, you know, you know, what's it mean? It means that the overall level of care starts dropping. And, and that's, you know, I guess that's our concern is that, um, I mean, we can't go out. We're not going to go out, and we're not going to, you know, close down our OB service, for instance. It's something you hear all the, you know, people talk about. We're not doing that because, you know, if we did that, I mean, there would be a, people at a tremendous risk. But our overall level starts to get degraded, and and that's problematic from us from a mission standpoint. It's very problematic from a community standpoint. So as as Trace as um, Steve says, we figure it out. But um, there is a point of, you know, really impacting our our individuals and our community, and um, and I'm I'm concerned. I'm concerned about this budget. I'm concerned about, you know, 
how many more rabbits can we pull out of the hat to make this work? And this is a real, this is a real, real challenging budget that we've got. We got to, um, you know, we got to figure out, and, and we need help. I mean, we and we don't usually ask for help, um, you know, and willy nilly. We ask it when we really need it, and this is one of them we have a need for. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Mike. Well, good morning. Still. Um, um, well, I just lost. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We we hear you. Well, I I just lost my ability to see you, but I'm going to trust you can still hear me. Um, so I I uh, I want to start with a uh, well, just a recognition that. Um, when we look at the uh, 2021 actuals, um, the range of free care to bad debt is between uh, 1 to 1.1 and 1 to 4.7. SBMC, by the way, is sort of in the squarely in the middle, 1 to 2.3. Um, and I guess I just want to start with a question, and I, I know we've had some of this conversation before, uh, Steve. Um, but um, is my uh, my presumption at the beginning uh, that looking at this ratio between free care and bad debt, uh, a, a way to have an insight about the overall functioning of not only the free care policy, but the functioning of, um, of the financial assistance system? I, I think you can, uh, but you know, one of the things that, that I always stress you know, there. When you look at free care, and you look at bad debt, um, free care is really for people who can't pay. Okay, bad debt is really people who won't pay. That's my the definition according to Steve. Okay, um, and we work very hard, um, and you know we have a couple of real real advocates for the patient um, that um, we try to get uh, everybody into free care if, if they qualify. Um, the problem ends up being in, in, in the people that don't want to be compliant, that we know they're in free, that they can qualify for free care, but they don't comply with the documentation requirements. And that's the people that end up in bad debt that are sort of in the gray area, that that are are people who really should be free care. Am I back? Yeah, yeah, you're you're back. Okay. Uh, we see you now. Um, so so you know, I want to say yes, it's a measurement, uh, but it's also I unfortunately cannot hear you. Okay, can everybody else hear me? Everybody yeah. else. Sam, if you can yeah. hear me, I think you should just go ahead and continue. I'm in having technical problems. Sure, no problem. Go so, ahead, Steve. Sorry. So anyway, so um, you know, it, it, is it an accurate measurement? Um, um, I, I'm not sure, um, but um, you know, we work real hard here to, you know, whenever we identify somebody, uh, we try to get them in, and if they're compliant, they get into free care. Uh, if they're not compliant, they end up in the bad debt um, uh, bucket. So, thanks for that. Um, I'm wondering, related to that, what are the obstacles of shifting? Maybe this is part of the same answer, but what prevents your hospital from shifting more of that that ratio to shift more towards free care as opposed to bad debt? I think it's compliance with um, the requirements by the people. Pe people are intimidated by it. Okay, even though we have a very, you know, um, personable person, very, you know, down to earth person. Um, I also think resources, I, I, but, you know, do I want to do, do, does the hospital want to um, bolster up our, our financial counseling um, just to transfer from one line item to another? Okay, I, 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 to be frank, I, I, I'd, I'd rather put a nurse on the floor. Then, then, then bolster up my free care staff, uh, especially when we're having challenges with uh, clinical care people. Uh, so, so we work, we work with what we got, 
and we try to keep, uh, you know, keep as as they say in baseball games, keep the line moving uh, without without spending a lot of resources. Thank you. Uh, this is our last question. Uh, in response to the board's follow-up questions, uh, specifically one about affordability, you wrote, quote, affordability is an interesting concept. It's well documented that high quality usually drives costs lower, thus making it more affordable for patients. Just wondering if you can elaborate a bit more on this response and how it takes place in the community you serve. So so I think I've said it. Uh, Jessica asked the question. Um, you know, we, we, we look at our First of all, I look at our overall cost structure at, at, at SVMC, and we're on the on lower side. I compare ourselves to other hospitals in Vermont and New York and Massachusetts. Um, when I look at our charge structure, as I explained earlier, that you know we try to keep people home. Um, when I say home, meaning in our, in our service area, and that will drive costs lower. Uh, and then our individual um, charges, I try to keep, uh, as I explained earlier, try to keep them uh, in balance uh, with our cost and what our competitors are charging. Okay, so, um, you know, and affordability, affordability to a person carrying a Blue Cross card that has 100% coverage is different than a person carrying a Blue Cross card that ha has a high deductible plan. Mm -hmm. And I think affordability is actually in the eyes of the cardholder and the individual. And affordability is very different from, um, you know, in the eyes of the person who has the, that, that gold, I'll call it the gold plan versus the, the, the bronze plan or, or, or has Medicare or Medicaid. Affordability is, is, is in, in a lot of times in the eyes of the beholder. But uh, we try to, at least I, uh, the team here, we, we try to manage that and try to be respectful of all of our, our patients and understanding who we serve. And, and also, Sam, just, just to add to that, I think we also have a, we have a philosophy here and also a strategy of becoming a high reliability organization, one that focuses on doing things, reducing errors, doing things effectively, doing things right the first time. As you, as you create that, that culture and, and systemness, that ultimately does drive down costs because you're, you're not repeating and, and hopefully reduce utilization and other things that drive up the cost of healthcare. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a philosophical system approach that we're, we're driving from our board on down at the, at the health system here. So I, um, I'm back. Uh, thank you, Sam, for taking over and um, perfect timing. Everything has worked completely perfectly until I started to speak this after uh, just now. So um, thanks, Sam, and thanks. Um, I, I didn't get to hear your answers, but I won't go back. But I uh, I do have um, one or two uh, very uh, one clarification question uh, in follow up to um, Chairwoman Holmes's inquiry about cross border Medicaid. I, I think I understand. Correct me if I'm wrong that there is relatively less cross-border Medicaid um, people coming from New York or Massachusetts over to your hospital on Medicaid. Do I have that correct? Definition of less, Mike. A, a smaller proportion. Um, so um, small, small proportion. Um, there's some barriers coming from Massachusetts um, because they have a, um, they have a one care equivalent uh, uh, which they try to keep uh, their patients home. Uh, New York State does try to promote um, keeping the Medicaid uh, patients in New York State, but we, we do get them. And there are differences in reimbursement, which which is uh, on my notes is a placeholder that uh, we'll probably uh, talk about at another time with specifics, which I don't have, but, you know, um, you know yeah. It's 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 one of those things that uh, I, I think there's winners and losers in the services when you look state to state and things like that. So, OK, and then one last one, um, uh, the new global commitment agreement um, has a interesting provision in there that gives the state some ability to increase provider reimbursement rates, Medicaid provider reimbursement rates outside of the budget neutrality cap. Um, and further, I think we have a, a waiver from the upper payment limit. 
um, in the global commitment cap. So I, I, I think what that means is that we are limited by the state's ability to raise the local funds uh, with respect to increasing provider reimbursement rates. Um, and so I guess my my question to you, uh, as somebody who is um, uh, also very focused on commercial rates, uh, commercial insurance premiums, um, whether if if we we the state was able to uh, uh, do a real honest uh, effort to increase some Medicaid provider rates, um, whether the whether you believe that that could be translated uh, and whether you could support translating th those new dollars, those uh, those drawn down federal dollars uh, into a, I'm going to just go all the way, a, a dollar for dollar decrease in commercial um, rates. So I'm going to I'm going to hedge my answer. Um, let's see the numbers. Let's see what the impact is. Um, and then I can probably comment. <laughs> okay. I think theoretically, yes, but specifically, uh, I, I, you've got to see the numbers. Because if, if we get a 1% increase, you know, and everybody's going to say you got an increase. Uh, so so we, have to, we have to see the impact. But, but, but conceptually, Mike, that was, that was one of the... <clears throat> Drivers behind us going into the whole one care program and was moving towards equalizing the reimbursement rates from all the payers and, and hopefully taking some of the pressure off the commercial side if the governmental uh, payers kind of anteed up appropriately. So I would say, in theory, yes, but as Steve said, the, the devil's always in the details. But um, I think it's we, we would certainly sit, sit down with interest and look at that with you guys and talk about it. Well, that's good. I, I, I think I'll just say, you know, as uh, from the advocates office perspective, um, I, I think um, it will be easier for us to you know, fiercely advocate for that um, with an agreement that there will be a, a, a dollar for dollar transfer of, of those monies into reduced commercial rates. Um, thanks so much. Those are the questions I have. And um, thanks for thanks for the uh, interesting morning. Great. Well, thank you. I think our last item then is just to open it up for public comment. So are there any comments from the public? Dale, I see your hand raised first. Welcome. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay, so I just had a quick list on your macro trend. Just a little bit of clarification. Your overall trend is a plus or minus. I know you can balance it out in the budget, but a little more on where you see that trend going on your workforce. I was wondering, you have um, traveling, well, people that are traveling nurses, whatever, that come in, but do you have traveling teams? Because I thought I heard you say like mobile. So I was wondering, is that teams or is that people? On your wait times, I was wondering as you work this through, can you actually get more in-person visits or are you going to diminish wait times by creating virtual visits? I know there are pressures in there, so I was looking for more information on that. Your bad debt. Uh, I want to push back. I think it's an assumption to say that people with bad debt can afford to pay if you've got a bronze plan and you max out over our medical event that maxes out all of your out-of-pocket expenses at once, that's a bad debt that isn't necessarily I can afford to pay. That's a bad debt that hit you so fast and so hard that you can't afford to pay it. So I just wanted to push back on that a little bit. Um, and I'm sorry. Services. And I'm sorry, this is the reporter. Before a response is given, could I please have your name who asked the question? Oh, Dale Hackett. Sorry, I never did my name. I was forget. <laughs> could you please spell your last name for the record? H-A-C-K-E-T-T, -T, and you can put an E on the end if you want to make me from Canada. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Proceed. You're welcome. <laughs> food security, when it comes to um, food security, I was concerned about people, especially that have certain medical conditions and have special diets. That's where I see there is a major factor in terms of, sure, I can hand them food, but based on their medical condition, that doesn't mean that they can actually use it. And last but not least, well, that is last, I crossed the last one off. So sorry, that was kind of a long list, but I went through it as fast as I could. Thank, Thank you, Dale. And uh, and I and I couldn't keep up with the list, so um, I, I hopefully we'll we'll. I'm going to go to Trey first uh, to talk about wait times. Yeah, so I mean the short answer to that, Dale, and thank you for pointing that out, is that our desire is to have patients seen in the right place, whether that's virtually, in person, uh, in a specialty center, or in an office. So we'll work to we were working to improve access in all of those areas again. To what's most appropriate you know telemedicine has a strong role but it is not by any means people hear me say this all the time uh, uh, uh the answer to many situations that require inpatient relationships um further with telemedicine there's some idea that you can make magic providers and those people serve on you know telemedicine that's not true you still have to get the physician and advanced practice provider involved and many of them don't want to sit around and do telemedicine visits all day. Um, there is they they lack some of the um, knowledge that they would gain by the in-person visit. So you know, in short, we'll we'll put the patient uh, physician relationship where it's most appropriate to improve access. So, so I I got a couple of other things uh, related to the travelers. Uh, that's a term that that we use, Dale. Um, when we bring in outside con contracted nurses or or professional staff. Um, so um, we we try here at Southwestern, um, you know, as we explained in the presentation, that um, we're, we're trying to maintain our staff and and use our own staff. But if the need arises, we can go out and get travelers and bring travelers in. Um, and, and, hey, Steve, just to add to yep. that, uh, again, Dale, this is more future, but. In our discussions with Dartmouth, we have talked about the concept of creating a, a cadre of travelers that could go around to all the system hospitals that help in their, their workforce needs. So that may be, that kind of goes to your terminology of a traveling team that can provide assistance. So not in place today, but certainly being actively discussed. I really like that idea. Thank you. So um, going to the comment I made about bad debt, and those who um, can't pay and won't pay, uh, your example of, of a person that has high deductibles and, and can't pay, um, uh, if they show up and they can't pay, but yet they have insurance, uh, there are ways for us to uh, get them into a program. Um, so, um, you know, the... The, the terminology I use isn't 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 applied to everybody, but um, uh, it's just a high level classification. And uh, the the people in bad debt that 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 can't pay, uh, a lot of them don't comply with the documentation requirements we have to do sliding scales or provide. Uh, uh, charity care too, and uh, if we got more people, and I think this is where Mike and and Sam and and I think you know uh, Act One Nineteen uh, and just good business practice, as we as we talk to our our patients who who may have a challenge meeting their coinsurance and deductibles, uh, making these programs available to them, and and maybe they have a five thousand dollar high deductible plan, and maybe they can afford a thousand dollars. So maybe we can get them into the free care for the other four, for the 4,000, uh, as an example. So working, you know, conversation and discussion uh, will help us move people into charity care and, and I'll, I'll call it sliding scale. Uh, so um, I, I don't know if that, that helps you understand uh, why I classify those in, in the two buckets. Uh, and food security um, is, um, you know, um, we're involved in that. And one of the things that I do know are our, 
our teams that go out to the homes, um, um, they do um, try to help secure. We have nurses that go out and follow up with uh, patients uh, in their homes, and we, we make sure that they have the right food. If, they, if they're diabetic, we make sure um, and, and we help them get, get food. If they're elderly and they need special needs, um, they um, uh, help. Uh, it's not perfect, and it, uh, but uh, it is a start. And uh, uh, I do know that they, they, they do secure uh, some food for, um, but it, it's not for every patient. Does that help? Thank you. Yes, it does very much. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your questions, Dale. Uh, are there anybody else? Is there anybody else from the public that wishes to make a comment? If you do, you can raise your hand. You can actually speak now since I don't see anybody with their hand raised. If somebody's having a hard time raising their hand on the Teams, feel free to speak up. Chair Chairwoman Holmes, can I just Mike Fisher here. Um, yeah. Can I? I just want to say out loud that uh, due to my technical problems, I've had a hard time hearing some things, but I, I very much appreciate the answer that Seema Jetjen just gave. Um, uh, I, I think it's important, and we look look forward to working on that. Great. Okay. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else from the public that would like to make a comment? All right. Seeing none. Hearing none, uh, Tom, Steve, and Trey, I really want to thank you very, very much for your clarity, for your candor, as always today, and but most importantly for all that you're doing for your community. It really came through in your presentation, and uh, I really appreciate your approach and that commitment. And I just want to say, you know, I agree with my colleagues on the board. They've said this, but I, I really think it's true. By going first, you have really set the bar high for the hospitals that will follow you, not only with the innovations you have, um, going on, but your proactive steps that you're taking to retain your workforce and to, you know, find cost savings and to build a real culture around delivering affordable care to your community. And, and a lot of the innovations that you do are, you know, admirable and uh, really highly valued. So also, if you can share my thanks to your staff, because I know it, it takes a village to do what you're all doing. So the three of you are here, but I know that there's many, many, many behind you that are that are helping out.